Bonjour tout le monde, j'espère que vous allez bien. On se retrouve aujourd'hui pour Zach en roue libre USA, le premier épisode ou alors le cinquième épisode de cette saison. Je suis ravi de vous retrouver dans un contexte un tout petit peu différent. Je vous vois dans le chat, vous êtes chaud, vous êtes bouillant et je suis extrêmement content de pouvoir le faire. Je, petit rappel pour euh, de ce qu'est le projet. Nous sommes allés aux états unis avec mon équipe pour avoir des créateurs de contenu américains, des créateurs de contenu qui changent. Donc on a une belle liste de personnes qu'on va pouvoir faire dans ces deux prochaines semaines. Donc au lieu d'avoir un Zakourli par semaine, vous en aurez sûrement deux, d'accord Deux, voire trois, selon les invités, selon les villes. Nous sommes à Los Angeles pour une semaine, ça fait déjà quelques jours qu'on est là et après, nous irons derrière à Dallas. J'espère que vous, vous allez bien. On est un petit peu tard, mais ici à Los Angeles, il n'est que 14h15, d'accord On a essayé de ne pas être trop en retard et tout, mais je pense en tout cas que vous allez kiffer. Euh, quelques petits mots pour vous expliquer comment va, va se passer l'émission. Nous avons euh, avec nous euh, ici aujourd'hui Alice. Alice qui est une traductrice et qui est avec nous. Salut Alice, tu vas bien Ouais, salut, ça va bien Vous m'entendez bien Ça va super bien, nous on t'entend bien sur le plateau, j'espère que le chat vous l'entendez bien. Et euh, Alice, est-ce que tu veux peut-être un petit peu t'introduire, te présenter pour ceux qui nous écoutent Ouais, bah écoute, euh, comme tu l'as dit, je suis traductrice, donc anglais-français, et j'ai l'habitude de faire ça, c'est un peu mon travail. S'il y a des gens qui sont un peu dans l'e-sport et qui suivent un petit peu, je fais pas mal de sous-titres pour des grosses euh, structures e-sport. Et voilà, et aujourd'hui je suis là pour trad. Donc c'est génial, on va pouvoir faire les traductions. On n'a peut-être pas le système le plus élaboré, mais c'est la première émission, donc je vous explique comment ça va se passer. Moi, je vais poser mes questions, donc nous allons avoir la petite discussion. Et à la fin, à chaque fois, Alice vous fera le petit recap de ce qui s'y est dit. Donc ceux qui parlent bien anglais, vous allez pouvoir suivre nos problèmes. Et ceux qui ne pipent rien à l'anglais, Alice est là pour gérer. Ensuite, un autre truc, je vais pouvoir introduire l'invité du jour qui m'a fait l'honneur de pouvoir passer aujourd'hui. En fait, je vous explique. Moi, je parle quand même assez bien anglais, donc je devrais pouvoir m'en sortir. On va pouvoir parler etc. Mon accent est mauvais, mais pour cette première émission, je vais vous demander comme un service d'être tolérant envers moi. Vous savez, tolérant, rendez-vous compte que c'est pas forcément simple, je vais devoir essayer de tenir une heure à une heure trente de discussion, je suis persuadé que ça va le faire, mais rappelez-vous ça en tête, ok, vannez-moi mon accent, vannez-moi mon anglais si vous voulez, mais rappelez-vous que l'exercice n'est pas facile, mais que d'émission en émission, je suis sûr que ça va un petit peu s'améliorer et que ce sera cool. Maintenant que j'ai dit ça, ça y est, j'ai envie d'introduire la personne que j'ai reçue aujourd'hui, c'est quelqu'un qui est iconique pour beaucoup d'entre vous, vous sachez que le fait que vous ayez beaucoup réagi à l'annonce, ça l'a chauffé, il s'est dit putain bordel, en fait ils ont vraiment envie de me voir et aujourd'hui je suis ravi d'accueillir Face Temper, hello Temper, how are you Hey ça va man Ça va Hey yo, you guys have a beautiful language bro, uh, first off I want to say that, I, I took a little bit of French in high school Yes I just know a little bit but like French is a sick language You really like the French language I love French bro, it's cool And do you think I have like a big, a big accent Yeah you have, an, you have an accent, you definitely have an accent for sure It's, it's great though, you know what I'm saying? My mom has an accent and like, she tries, sometimes she tries to fix it. She has like, she's from Brazil. Um, sometimes she tries to fix it and I'm like, nah mom, just keep it. It sounds good. Like, it, it gives you character, it's you. Thank you. Voilà, vous avez vu ce qu'il est... eh, qu est qu a dit Il a dit que j'avais un accent, mais que ça donnait du caractère. Et je suis content. I'm happy you said that because they always mock my accent. They say, oh, you have a big accent. You have a big accent. And I say, no, it's my character. Yeah, it's exactly, who I am. Man. No, it adds character. It's, it's important. <laughs> How are you? Do you feel good? Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm really happy to, and really glad that you accepted to come here. Uh, I suppose that you didn't know about Zach and Rulli, but uh, the fact that you accepted and uh, first and foremost, almost accepted to be the first one to come here. It's a, a big honor for me. No, yeah, brother, thank you for having me. This is, I'm excited. I'm really excited. I didn't know too much about you. And uh, my manager, he, uh, he just signed me up for this. Like without, like he, normally he asked me, yo, you want to do this or not? This time he was like, I just said that you were going to do it. I'm like, bro, why didn't you ask me? And then I, I saw, I went on Twitter and I saw you mentioned me. I saw all the engagement. I saw all the guys, like everybody was hyped and stuff. So you got a, you got a pretty cool fan base yourself. And, uh, You know, I'm looking forward to, to the, doing this podcast. Alice, dis-leur ce qu'il a dit parce que je suis sûr que ça va être du miel à leurs oreilles. Euh, C'est incroyable. Donc, euh, il disait que justement, d'habitude, son manager, quand il y a des projets euh, comme ça, il lui pose toujours la question en lui disant Est-ce que tu as envie de le faire et tout Là, son manager, il lui a rien dit. Il lui a dit Mec, t'y vas, c'est tout. Et en fait, il a découvert avec euh, l'annonce de Zach sur Twitter et il a vu tous les tweets, tout l'engagement qu'il y avait et il est en mode euh, Bah, let's go en fait, je vais y aller direct. Vous l'avez chauffé à blanc et c'est grâce à vous qu'on va pouvoir réussir à faire une très bonne émission. Donc comme d'habitude dans un corps libre, vous connaissez, on aime bien en savoir plus à propos de la personne. L'un des avantages de cette émission, c'est qu'on va pouvoir avoir un point de vue américain, une histoire américaine. Uh, what I was saying is the fact that we will have some different story than the usual uh, guest that I have. So... Well, I'm still gonna start off with the usual stuff. I'm gonna ask you to tell us more about you. So I'm gonna ask, who are you? 
Where do you come from? And uh, what did you study when you were younger? All right, so uh, my name is Tommy, otherwise known as Face Temper. Uh, I come from Brazil. Um, I was born in Minas Gerais, which is a, a state uh, not a lot of people know about. But when I was seven, and I grew up with a single mom. And when I was seven, my mom uh, took me to America, took me to Boston. And the plan was to stay there for six months. We didn't end up going back. So we just stayed in America. Uh, I grew up like, you know, I, I came from like a kind of like a poor family. And um, my like my mom's side was poor. My my father's like middle class in Brazil. But um, I grew up just with my mom. Right. And so she took me took me away. And it was crazy. You know, going from Brazil to Boston it was like culture shock, man. Like it was like polar opposite you know, completely different worlds. What were the big differences that you noticed or that you shocked you the most? The biggest differences were definitely the people. You know, people were very different. Like people in Brazil are very warm. They're, you know, very friendly. Uh, they'll take you into their house and put food in your stomach, you know, no matter who you are. <laughs> and in America, it's like, like, especially in Boston, people don't really say hi to strangers, you know, like they don't really interact. It's very cold. Like people over there, much colder. Um, And uh, it's different depending on where you go in America. Like East Coast people will wear their heart, heart more on their sleeves. They'll tell you how it is. They're, you know, more real. And then like, I feel like people out here kind of don't tell you how they feel. Like they might not like you, but they'll act like they do. You know, it's, it, you gotta, you gotta, you pick your poison. You gotta know like where you are, but there's, there's a lot of pros, you know, I'm, I'm really, um, it, it, it was a hard adjustment for me from, I think from like seven years old to 15, I didn't have an American friend. Okay. So I didn't have anybody to show me the culture. Okay. Right? You, you were only like uh, uh, going out with uh, people from your community maybe or people that yeah. speak maybe Portuguese. Exactly. Or? Exactly. So only people that spoke Portuguese, a couple Brazilian friends. I played, I was still playing, you know, football or soccer. Um, I was still playing that uh, up until I was 14 and uh, I didn't have anybody really helping me to play to, like soccer i didn't have any friends that played because no one played over there it was like you gotta either play basketball football or, or or something else and so when i gave up um around this time i i'd been playing video games still like i i started playing video games when i was four years old okay and then um because i didn't have any friends i would gravitate towards video games okay because that was my safe haven that was my like okay well let me disconnect from this world and be connected in this world and Then uh, the concept of online gaming came about, and I think my first online game was RuneScape. Oh, you know RuneScape? Yeah, of course I know RuneScape. RuneScape. I, I know that RuneScape is still going, and there is still a community in RuneScape. RuneScape, sick, bro. It's one of the best games I've ever played, and it, it taught me about economics. You know, it taught me a lot. It taught me how to like communicate with people. It taught me like that you can't trust everybody because I got my account hacked early on when I first started playing. <laughs> Classic. Uh, yeah, right. Classic. Oh. In France, we have a game that is not like RuneScape, but it's really, really nice. It's called Dofus. Okay. And the Dofus community is really big. It's really engaged. And uh, they were same stuff. Account hacked and stuff. Is it, and is it it's, it's like an MMORPG too? Kind of it, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. The Dofus communities are here and they, I'm sure a lot of people who listen to us play Dofus and yeah. they can relate to what you say on RuneScape. Oh, okay, cool. Well, yeah, so uh, RuneScape was my first online game. Then then I got, um, it was funny, uh, I got uh, an Xbox, the original Xbox, and then I started playing Halo 2. That was my first online like controller game. And I got the mic and stuff, you know, <laughs> Got online, you heard people talking and stuff, and then uh, the, the 20 the twenty dollar uh, Xbox Live headset yeah, yeah, that yeah. you can broke. <laughs> <laughs> that was the one. That was the one. That was the one. Um, so I was playing that, and then I played Halo 3, I got the 360, played Halo 3, and then um, my friends were playing Call of Duty, and I switched over to Call of Duty 4. That was that was my first Call of Duty, and I remember my my best friend at the time. He he, he was my neighbor. Um, he was my first American friend when I was like 15. So him and his family like Americanized me. Okay. You know, they, I got, I got mad love and respect to them always because they really took me in and like, you know, um, th this is just one of my best friends, right? From, from back home. They helped you to get more integrated, to learn about or yeah, and discover the culture. Bro, I'm telling you right now, like when I was younger, I was very gullible. Okay. Right. And uh, I was also, I also didn't understand what sarcasm was. So you, you were like pretty straightforward. 
like uh, first uh, yeah. in France we say premier degré which means if uh, we make a joke or a little bit of sarcasm you're gonna take it personally exactly. you won't understand exactly bro so like the kids that I thought were like my friends in middle school like weren't like they weren't really my friends they were they would pick on me and shit and uh, I, I used to get bullied in middle school and like It's all love, you know, it made me who I am. I wouldn't change a thing about, I don't have like regrets in life, you know, I, I believe that everything happens for you the way that it should. Okay. And you take, you either learn from it or you don't, you know, so um, it, it toughened my, you know, toughened my skin and uh, it is what it is. But uh, yeah, my my friend Americanized me, he, he taught me a lot. And then uh, um, he was like, yo, uh, play Call of Duty because all my friends were playing Call of Duty. So I was like, all right, let me switch from Halo to Call of Duty. Let me just try, let me try Call of Duty out. I go on Call of Duty 4. We uh, hop in a private match. I'm like, yo, I just need to warm up. Like, let's do like a 1v1 or something. So I think we played on Crossfire or Strike. Crossfire. Yeah. Usually the 1v1 on Code 4 is on cheap mint. Yeah, right. But I was just like, I don't know. I didn't know the maps and stuff yet. So um, he, he was using an M16. I chose the MP5 and... I wasn't aiming down sight because when you play Halo, you don't aim down sight. Yes. But I would just, bro, the first five kills were me. Like, I just <laughs> killed him like like five times. I'm like, bro, this shit's easy. Like, I'm good. <laughs> then, Only uh, no scoping against an M16. It's not easy. Huh? Yeah, but with the MP5, it's good hip fire and stuff. So I would just find him and stuff. Um. Anyways, and then I started. And then two months later, after playing Call of Duty 4 for two months, Modern Warfare 2 came out. And then... Bro, I, I, I begged my mom to take me to Target <laughs> to buy a Modern Warfare 2 because I was not 18 at the time. I think I was 15 or 16. Yes, in the US, the regulation was strict about Modern Warfare 2. That's why there were no esport uh, event on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was 16 at the time. I had to beg my mom to buy me the game. She bought me the game the day it came out. And um, it was it was a wrap after that, man. Modern Warfare 2 changed <laughs> everything. <laughs> that game changed everything for, for so many people. And like, That community, it created the online community that, you know, like it was the first real community from, from gaming. Like it was so popular and uh, everybody and their mom played Modern Warfare 2, right? Of course. It was the mainstream thing. Yeah. That was, man, the, the first couple of years of that game, incredible. We are going to speak about Modern Warfare 2 in a couple of seconds. I'm just going to... Talk to the chat. Je vous vois, les amis. Je vois que vous kiffez. They said that you speak uh, very clear English, so they can almost understand uh, right, right uh, properly, I mean. But il uh, y a quand même Alice. Et pour ceux qui ne comprennent rien, alors, on a dit beaucoup de choses. Alice, si tu arrives à peut-être expliquer rapido pour qu'on puisse continuer gentiment, mais franchement, ouais. rien que cette première partie, c'était exceptionnel. J'ai absolument tout noté, mais je vais vous faire un petit sum up euh, un peu rapide. Donc, euh, pour ceux qui ne le connaissent pas, c'est Tommy ou alors Temper. Donc, il vient du Brésil, d'une toute petite ville. Euh, il a été élevé par sa mère. Et ça. en fait, à 7 ans, ils sont partis euh, à Boston, aux États-Unis. Et au départ, il devait rester juste pendant 6 mois. Et au final, ils ne sont jamais partis. Euh, donc, il vient un peu d'une famille qui n'est pas hyper riche. Euh, et du coup, pour lui, ça a été un énorme choc culturel parce que pour lui, au Brésil, les gens sont hyper sympas, chaleureux et tout. Et aux États-Unis, Boston, c'est un peu l'inverse. quoi. Personne va te dire bonjour dans la rue. Y a ah, pas les gens étaient un peu froids et tout, quoi. ça l'a marqué. Ouais. ouais, il en parlait vraiment euh, en disant bon, ça dépend où t'es aux États-Unis. Si t'as les bons coins et les gens ils sont un peu chill, ça passe. Mais par contre, euh, parfois, ils sont un peu focus, quoi. Donc après, pour lui, en fait, euh, il n'avait pas trop de potes euh, quand il était euh, aux états unis de, cette, de ses 7 à 15 ans, parce que, bah, par exemple, pour jouer au foot, bah, eux, là-bas, ils jouent que au basket ou alors au football américain. Et comme lui, il jouait au football, bah, le nôtre, quoi, celui d'Europe, de euh, il était un peu, euh, un peu solo, quoi. Ou alors, il traînait avec les gens de sa commu, quoi. Donc, euh, les gens qui parlaient brésilien, euh, portugais et tout. Et c'est comme ça, en fait, qu'il s'est lancé un peu dans les jeux vidéo. Il a commencé quand il avait... 4 ans du coup. C'est ça. Et euh, après, son premier jeu online, c'était Runscape, si je me trompe pas. Puis après, ça. il a joué à Halo sur euh, Xbox. Et en fait, c'est son voisin qui l'a lancé sur euh, Call of Duty. Donc lui, il connaissait pas du tout. Et son voisin, c'était un Américain. Et sa famille l'a un peu pris euh, sous son aile en disant Bon, écoute, on va, on va un peu t'américaniser pour que tu, connaisses à com à, tu comprennes un peu les bases, quoi. C'est ça. Et c'est comme ça qu'il s'est mis à jouer à Call of Duty. Donc euh, un jour, ils ont fait un, un, un V1, quoi, parce qu'ils ne connaissaient pas trop le jeu. Et les 5 kills, en fait, c'était lui. Quoi. Donc euh, il a vite pris en main le, le truc. Et juste après, tu avais Modern Warfare 2 qui sortait. Donc Exactement. il avait 15 ans à ce moment-là. Et euh, il a supplié sa mère, parce que du coup, aux États-Unis, il y a des régulations comme quoi tu ne peux pas acheter des jeux vidéo si tu n'es si pas majeur, je crois, il ça. me semble. 
C'est exactement ça, ouais. MW2, il y avait une très très grosse difficulté. C'est pour ça que les Ang... enfin, en Amérique, avant, il n'y avait pas trop d'event Modern Warfare 2. C'est un jeu qui a été frappé de beaucoup d'interdictions. Ouais, exactement. Et du coup, en fait, c'est pour lui, c'est un peu la première grosse communauté de jeux vidéo en ligne. Et pour lui, c'est un peu genre la famille, quoi. C'est vraiment le premier gros truc. Dédicace à Alice, ça fait super plaisir. She, tran she translated perfectly everything wow. you said. Wow, that's incredible. That's crazy. Hey, She's a professional. Hey, you need a raise or something, voice. bro. That's that's crazy. I was like, I was thinking in my head, I'm like, is she gonna translate all that? Probably not. But like, uh, she, she did everything. I've she did everything. That's impressive. Wow. That's big respect to Alice. Yeah. Um, she's really doing a great work. Je sais que les amis pour certains disent, ce serait peut-être mieux de traduire après tout ça machin. Mais pour la première, on fait comme ça et puis on verra plus tard si on peut améliorer et tout. On essaye. Tout n'est pas parfait. C'est le parti pris pour aujourd'hui. Et je pense que ce sera très cool comme ça. So it's really cool that you spoke uh, about the fact how you started playing Call of Duty uh, because um, it was one of the main question I had. Uh, and uh, I, I like the fact that you emphasize that uh, Modern Warfare 2 coming out was a massive change and a massive uh, like uh, uh, event for a lot of people. It shook the world. Like it shook the entire world. And uh No, that game did it all. That game started it, it all. It was the, uh, that was it. That was the game. What uh, were you, uh, do, do you remember maybe the, maybe the feeling you had in the first couple of games you, uh, you had when you were younger, when the game came out? I don't, I don't really remember the feeling, but it I just remember that it was really hard to get off the game. You know, like I didn't want to get off the game. I, I would stay up like it was my first time staying up all night before going to school, like having to go to school off like no energy just because I was playing the game all night, search and destroy, just ninja diffusing the whole night. Like I was like, <laughs> um, no, it was crazy. It was it was really crazy. And I, I was um going back to like school, like I was a terrible student. I really like if I didn't have interest in the subject, I wasn't paying attention. I was yes. just in class doodling, looking out the window, thinking about daydreaming you know like it, i had to be interested in the subject for me to really pay attention where, where did you stop your studies maybe where, where did you, you you had a diploma maybe yeah i got a i mean i graduated high school and then i took a year off and during that year i i was 18 um phase was making money off the youtube channel like we were making good money i um i think like we started selling clothes too i think we might have had a sponsorship with G Fuel at the time. So yeah, we were, the G Fuel scuff early days yeah, and stuff. So we were making money and um, I bought my car. I remember like uh, at the time I bought a 2009 BMW 335. Um, so it was a nice car for like an 18 year old. Like it was uh, at the time, like I think it was 2012. And uh, I got my own apartment. Um, this was before banks moved in. This is, it was me and my friend who was like a, He was more of like a real person. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like when I say real person, I mean like real world. Like oh, yes. he, he worked in the real world, right? Okay. Like, like the, this, this world that we, that we are part of, like it, back then it was not real at all. It no, was- The video game, nerdy world. Yeah. It was kind of weird for yeah, normal like people. people. People are like, oh, you play video games? Okay, yeah, right. You know, um, so I lived with him and he had a good head on his shoulders. Like he knew how to like, he was also a handyman. Okay. Um, He was, he was a plumber too. So he knew how to like, listen, my mom took care of me completely, right? Like I didn't know how to make food. I didn't know how to clean. I didn't know how to do my laundry back then. I was like 18, just like living off of Hot Pockets and pizza rolls and <laughs> Mountain Dew, you know what I'm saying? So when pizza I Pizza roll, Call of Duty and Mountain Dew. <laughs> That is the classic combo. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so um, I was in my apartment. I had a girlfriend at the time. That was my first girlfriend and I, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Like, like my friends, would, like some of my friends would tell me, you, you should go to school. And I'm like, like, what would I go to school for? So I decided to take a year off, see how I feel. And then think about it the next year. Next year comes around my, my roommate, Will, um, my good friend, Will, he, um, he suggested I should go to school for like business or marketing. Yes. The classic way. Right. So I'm like, okay, you know what? That's, he convinced me it was a good idea. I said, all right. Fuck you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this. So I go to a community college, like nearby, I was called Northern Essex Community College. I, I think I went for almost a semester and I was dealing with like, there was like a lot of phase stuff happening, right? Like there was 
So I'm in, I remember I was in class. There was a math test going on. And in my head, there was like a lot of like stuff going on with FaZe. So that like I'm in class for like business. I'm in school for business. Meanwhile, my actual business is like, there's a lot of things happening. And thriving. Right. And, and then um, the girl that I was talking to at the time, I was having problems with her. And meanwhile, I'm like trying to focus on a math test that I really don't care about. And so I'm thinking like, why am I here? So I, I just get up. I start to walk out. And the teacher's like, where are you going? I said, home. <laughs> I'm going home. And I, I It's left. not for me. That was it, bro. I was gone. That was the last time I stepped in into college, you know? Uh, yeah. Alice, je t'en supplie, raconte-moi cette anecdote parce que vraiment, elle était magnifique. Alors du coup je reprends vite fait un petit bien peu sûr, ce que juste avant Donc euh, pour lui euh, il sou... La question du coup tu t'avais posé C'était euh, pour lui Modern Warfare, euh, Warfare 2 Est-ce ouais, est est que c'était genre euh, Un gros changement Comment il avait un peu vécu le jeu et tout Est-ce qu'il se rappelait des sensations Donc lui il disait que bah, les sensations il s'en rappelait Mais genre, genre vraiment pas Par contre pour lui c'était vraiment le jeu du siècle Et c'était surtout le sentiment qu'il y avait avec l'addiction Tu sais genre de ouais. jouer jusqu'à tard et tout Alors que t'avais école le lendemain et tout C'était vraiment le premier gros truc comme ça de, de sa vie quoi Voilà exactement et euh, donc après il nous a raconté qu'il était un peu genre mauvais élève à l'école, ça l'intéressait pas, c'est un peu genre rêveur, regardé par la fenêtre et tout. Mais il a quand même eu son bac. Et après, euh, du coup il vivait, euh, il a eu son appartement à 18 ans, il s'est acheté une voiture, donc il était un peu posé, mais comme sa mère c'était un peu une maman poule, il savait rien faire tout seul quoi. Donc il mangeait la pizza, il buvait du Mountain Dew, et puis bah c'était un, un gros geek pion quoi, comme, euh, comme on les connaît. Et euh, au bout d'un an il s'est dit bon, son pote lui a conseillé de faire euh, un an genre euh, de business marketing et tout donc il s'est dit bon vas-y euh, je vais tenter ça a l'air pas trop pas trop mal quoi ouais, le truc classique école de commerce et compagnie ouais, c'est euh... le truc que tu fais quand tu sais pas quoi faire quoi. par défaut ouais ouais et du coup bah il y était il a fait genre un semestre et un jour il était en, en contrôle de maths et en fait il s'est posé et il s'est dit il y avait des trucs qui se passaient avec Faze et tout à ce moment là euh, des gros contrats des trucs comme ça euh, il s'était pris la tête avec sa copine et tout, et il s'est dit, mais en fait, qu'est-ce que je suis en train de foutre là, à, à juste en train de penser à mon contrôle de maths, quoi Est-ce que c'est vraiment ça que je veux faire de ma vie Et du coup, il s'est levé, en plein contrôle, et le prof lui a dit, mais tu, tu vas où là Et il a regardé, il lui a dit, je vais à la maison. Et c'est de cette manière qu'il a arrêté le collège. Merci Alice, franchement, tu gères, ça fait vraiment plaisir. <rire> In a, like, I, I was going to to ask you a question about phase, um, about the fact that uh, in 2010, you know, uh, in the modern for two uh, days, it was very popular to have like a sniping team or a sniping and content team. Mm -hmm. There were some names like uh, Dare, Sor, Optic, and stuff. Um, you were uh, you were part part uh, of phase uh, pretty early. Uh, tell us more about how you created the team or and how you joined the adventure. So first of all, shout out to Optic, because without Optic, we probably wouldn't be here, you know? Optic so they, was the base. Yeah, Optic was the team. They, they started in 2007. Big shout out to my guy Hector. I think you're going to sit down with him. We're going to have Hector next I week. I love on Hector, board. man. Right I love Hector, bro. He really, uh, he showed us mad love early. And um, that's my big brother, you know? Like, he really set the tone early on uh, for all of this. And uh, he paved the way, you know? So that, that Optic started in 2007. And in 2010... I had already been uh, sniping. Like, I remember the first week I played Modern Warfare 2, I think I was using regular guns and stuff. And then I ran into this, uh, this quick scoper. Yes. Like, the sniper, like, and he was just sniping everyone so fast. I'm like, what, what's going on? I'm like, how do you do this? And then he, uh, I was talking to him. He was cool. Um, he, he was the first one to bring me into a private match on Rust. And okay. I remember that feeling like it was yesterday. Like, I'm like, oh, what's this map loading up? Like, Rust? Like, private match, what's going on? You don't play that much Rust when you launch some uh, regular TDM or Domination. Exactly. It was wasn't just, that much in the playlist. Yeah, yeah, you don't, you didn't know. So, he did, you know, so he, he took me in there and uh, he taught me, I learned how to no scope first and then, like, pop shots and then eventually the quick scope. Um, shout out to him, bro. His gamer tag at the time was uh, Days Hipfire. Days, right? Funny. Um, anyways, he, he was, like, nasty back in the day. And so... Uh, he taught me how to how to snipe. He taught me how to quick scope, and I was so fascinated by it. I was like blown away, like how you can, you know, it, that that game felt incredible. Everything about it, you know, except for like the noob tubes and and uh, painkiller. Yes, you know what I'm saying. Yes, yes, yes. You, you and danger close. And which one? Danger close. Oh, danger close. Yeah, you remember nah, nah. danger close? Yeah, I forgot about that. So 
take those things away. I mean, listen, Modern Warfare 2 is as close to a perfect game as you can get. It's 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 perfect. The colors, all the maps, um, the gunplay, the weapon sway, like just the graphics, like the trick shotting in that game was phenomenal. And um, before that, like people weren't really trick shotting. I know Zerg Grizz was the first one to do a 360 yes. in Call of Duty 4. And so I remember the first time I saw a 360, I was like, what? My world just flipped, bro. <laughs> like my world just flipped upside down. And so um, I was in a, I was like a nerd, bro. I was like in these like sniping forums, right? And uh, I remember one day my friend Red Octo, he posted a, uh, a link to a video and that was FaZe House Cat Meow Mix 1. And I'm like, what is this? And I, that was my, the first time I saw FaZe, right? Okay. And this was, this was early June of 2010. FaZe was created in May 30th of 2010. And so by early June, I had already known about what FaZe was. And uh, I watched that video and I was like, damn, this this dude is nasty. Like this dude is crazy. And then uh Ilcam's the first and then this next video I watched was Ilcam's five. Okay. And I was like, whoa, like that just changes the game for me. I was blown away. Immediately I like I loved the style of FaZe and like FaZe clan. I was just like, this is sick. Like if I'm gonna like I didn't really think at the time like I'm gonna be a part of this team because I think I had I was running my own team. I was running three different teams before FaZe. Oh. Like I was, I, I uh, thought you were going to say at the same time. I was like, oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. So um, when I was in Halo, I, I, I always understood the concept of a team. Okay. Right. So I don't know if it's because of football or soccer from because I'm being from Brazil and like I know it's cultural. Right. So like I just knew like you can do so much more with a team than you can by yourself. Um, so in in Halo, I was a. I, I created a team with my friends and stuff. And then Call of Duty came around. We created a team where we would just go in the lobbies and just talk shit and have fun, you know, just the homies. And then uh, I got into like a sniping team. I co-led that one. And then um, I started playing a lot of competitive sniping. Were you familiar with that? Yes. So They were playing with Marathon and stuff. It was private lobbies. Yeah, They were yeah, sniping each head, other. Headquarters on Scrapyard. Yes. And like, it, it was fun, bro. Like 3v3, 4 like. 4v4. Sometimes they even play Capture the Flag. Yeah, Capture the Flag too. On Favela, like, oh my God, Capture the Flag was fun. You I remember? Arrived. Yeah, of course, man. <laughs> Competitive sniping was the shit, bro. That that made me a lot better at sniping. And so um, I was doing, I was really into that. That was my last team before FaZe uh, called NK. And I was leading that. And then um, I remember uh, my One of the kids, I went solo for like a week. Okay. I, I decided, you know what? Like, I'm going to change my name. I'm just going to try being solo because like, I'm just whatever. Right. Okay. So I went solo for about a week and it was so boring. Right. It, it just felt like, I need, like, it felt empty, you know? And so I saw FaZe was having tryouts. Uh, it was like the first time that FaZe had tryouts and uh, it was like free for all. And like, that's my bread and butter, bro. Like I grew up playing free for all and, Halo even. So okay. I was just like, all right, let me let me try out. At the time, one of the kids that was a part of NK, my team, had already joined FaZe. And he's like, yo, FaZe is having tryouts. He's the one that told me. So I'm like, all right, bet. Like, FaZe is sick. So like, let me let me try out. So they put you all in a free-for-all and it was... They put me and like seven or eight other people in a free-for-all. We play like, and I think we played like three games. I won two of them. And then uh, me and this other kid, Recon at the time, like joined, like we got recruited. And uh, back then it was like Resistance, Magic, and uh, uh, J-Cakes. Okay. And Housecat, which was like the, the guy that had the PVR, right? Like the other guys didn't. Um, he was also the best sniper out of all of them. Um, he was the guy that was editing like the videos and stuff. So he was capturing, uh, recording, and uh, editing. When I tried out and I joined, he was, uh, he was no longer a part of FaZe. So he left the day before. Because, like, the other people weren't doing anything. Oh, and Clips. Clips was also a part of FaZe. But he left because the other people weren't doing anything. So he joined a different team okay. called Rise, R-I-Z-E. Um, and because uh, they were doing they were doing more stuff. And so as soon as I joined, I basically just started, like, I was extremely passionate. You know, like, the key word for all of this, like, the creation of all of this is passion, right? And I know you know that because without passion... You're not going anywhere. I, I made the 11 hour of flight uh, for passion. 11 hour flight? <laughs> to come here. Uh, hey, that's respect though, for real. No, I appreciate you coming, man, for real. Um, 
but yeah, no, I was extremely passionate. And then as soon as I joined, I, I was bas I basically took it over. I was just like uh, editing videos. I was designing graphics. Oh. I got. I ended up getting a PVR soon after. But before the PVR, I would record my TV with the camera, like the one that you're using now. I would zoom in. We all made something like this. Yeah, you it know, was poor. Bro, it was <laughs> crazy. I used this. to have the setup like behind here, and then I would sit on my like stepdad's bed. But I would sit on the ground so like it wouldn't get my head, right? So I'd be on the ground like this, like, gaming and shit. And uh, then I got the PVR. Um, you know, I was editing I was editing videos, designing graphics, recruiting players, and then sniping and, you know, like doing all that stuff. And um, I just fell in love with it. Like I was like, this is it. Like this is. And when I joined, there was 800 subscribers. I first found out about FaZe at 500 subscribers. Okay. When I joined, there were 800 subscribers. And then when we had 4,000 subscribers, that's when I knew we had something okay. incredibly special. Like, that's when I, I couldn't tell you what it was. But there was something. There was something, like, that I could not explain to you. If you put a gun to my head, I couldn't tell you what it is, but I could tell you that it was something incredibly special. And that was the, that was the moment I knew we had something. Ah, la, la. Franchement, je, je bois ces paroles. Ok, du coup, je vais, je vais je traduire un petit peu ce qu'il a Bien sûr, a bien raconté. sûr, force, force, force. Donc, euh, tu, tu lui demandais du coup comment il avait un peu rejoint Face, comment ça s'était passé et tout. Surtout qu'à l'époque, il y avait beaucoup de trucs, un peu comme euh, des, des teams un peu comme Optique et tout, qui, qui existaient déjà. Donc, euh, lui, il a dit bah, shout out à Optique parce que bon, sans eux, on serait jamais là, quoi. Et euh, du coup, il disait d'ailleurs que même Hector de Optique, euh, il l'avait emmené sur son euh, premier match euh, sur euh, Russ. C'est ça. C'est là qu'il lui a pris genre euh, le no scope, euh, comment snipe, euh, faire des quick scope et tout. Et euh, que euh, du coup. Euh, après, lui, comment, comment il a rejoint FaZe En fait, c'est un peu un truc où genre, il regardait les vidéos et euh, il s'est dit « Waouh, wow, le mec, les mecs qui font les games là, ils sont vraiment genre, trop chauds et tout. Moi, je veux trop faire pareil et tout. » Et euh, en fait, à cette époque-là, il jouait à, à, à l'eau et il connaissait déjà, il avait un peu genre, le potentiel des équipes. Quoi. Il savait ce que, ça, ce que ça voulait dire de jouer en équipe. Il pense que ça vient de ses gènes du Brésil et tout. Et euh, du coup, euh, il avait déjà eu trois équipes avant de, de rejoindre FaZe. C'est ça. Et euh, donc, euh, lui, il aimait beaucoup tout ce qui était la compétitive euh, sniping et tout. Et son ancienne team, je crois que c'était NK, si je ne me trompe pas. Ouais, euh, il, a, il a eu plusieurs teams avant, ouais, que ce soit sur Halo, sur Code et tout, ouais. Et euh, du coup, en fait, après, euh, il, y avait, il y avait un de ses anciens teammates qui avait déjà, un, déjà rejoint un phase. Et en fait, à ce moment-là, il faisait des tryouts. Et du coup, euh, son pote lui a dit, écoute, euh, tente, quoi. Ça se trouve, tu vas, tu vas être pris, quoi. Et euh, du coup, il l'a il a fait. Et euh, il était avec euh, d'autres personnes. Et au final, euh, je crois qu'ils les ont mis en free for all, je crois. Et euh, sur les trois games qu'ils ont fait, il en a gagné deux. Et il a été pris euh, direct après. Et en fait, à cette époque-là, FaZe, bah, ils avaient perdu déjà un peu les gens qui faisaient des edits de vidéos et tout. Et du coup, lui, quand il a rejoint, comme il est hyper passionné euh, par ce qu'il fait, il a repris tout ça. C'est ça. Donc, euh, il disait même qu'il filmait de sa télé un peu, tu sais, les setups à l'ancienne et tout. Ouais, la ta caméra, caméra sur la télé, et tout, etc. Euh, pour okay. pas qu'on te voit, tu te caches un petit peu et tout. Et, euh, et que voilà, du coup, c'est comme ça qu'il a, qu a commencé son, le process chez FaZe. Et il recrutait même les, les, players, fin, les joueurs et tout. Il faisait vraiment plein de trucs chez eux. Exactement. Et en plus de ça, pour vous dire, il avait un rôle très hybride. C'est lui qui avait repris le HDPVR. Donc le HDPVR, c'est avec ça qu'on enregistrait à l'époque. Et il avait repris une sorte de rôle très hybride où il faisait plusieurs trucs. Franchement, c'est super impressionnant. You said that when you have, uh, when Face reached 4000 subscribers, that's the time when you knew there was something. Um, if I, I think if we had to remember Face for something on YouTube, the early days it was the phase hill comes and i was speaking to you uh, about uh, about it before the show uh, i was even following the phase faki has game the faki has game and uh, how did you experience uh, this evolution of phase back then when uh, the phase hill comes and stuff became like very popular yeah il cams was our bread and butter il cams was amazing like and uh Um, I knew I knew that was our bread and butter. And so every week it was like Saturday morning cartoons, right? When you would like wake up, you'd go on Twitter and like wait for the next ill camps to drop. Um, but for me, you know, I understood that concept of ill camps immediately because I had been skateboarding for three years prior to, to playing Call of Duty. Okay. And it reminded me a lot of skateboarding videos. The tricks and stuff. The tricks, yeah. The tricks, the music, the edits. Just like the, the way the video flows. Okay. You know, if it wasn't for skateboarding, FaZe would not be like 
the, you know what I'm saying? I don't it's, think FaZe would be here without... It's amazing to know that the skateboarding had an influence on how the FaZe Hill cams were made. Massive influence. And um, I used to edit a lot of the ill cams. I think we have 50 ill cams. I, I edited about 16 of them. Um, like after I joined, I think I joined at when there was like eight. And then I edited nine. And then, um, I don't know. Anyways, yeah, skateboarding had a massive influence. And when, uh, when we were... Uh, when we were just doing 360s and like 720s and swap 720s and stuff, like I was thinking, because uh, you had mentioned the, the temper shot, right? Yes. So uh, back then, I was thinking like, we need something else. Like we need something like, we're all, all doing the same things. We need to do something else. And Modern Warfare 2 was the perfect game because it a lot, like, it was the greatest trick shotting game. No, no Call of Duty has ever even come close to that level. Never as far as trick shotting, like the style of that game is just impeccable. And so, um, I remember I was on rust back on rust. And, uh, I think I spent like bro, 10, at least 10% of my time played on Modern Warfare 2 was on private match rust. Just on private match training and yeah, training uh, new trick ones shots. or like free for all or trick shots and stuff like that. And so I remember I was standing at the top and I'm thinking, okay, like how do we, you know, like that's how I created the temper shot. And it was- uh, That was my next question. How did the temper shot uh, like exist? How did you come in your mind that, okay, so I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna scope, and then I'm gonna unscope, yeah. rotate, and then yeah. boom, no scope. It's like amazing. And it's, uh, I think one of the most iconic shots. I saw before the beforehand to prepare this interview, I saw you made a, a tutorial the tutorial about the temper shot had 6 million views. It's crazy. Yeah, it's nuts, bro. Cause I, so the first, trick tip tutorial I saw for Call of Duty was um, Zerg Grizz. He, he made the G-Shot on Call of Duty 4. And I remember back then watching it, I'm like, this has a million views. Like, whoa, that's crazy. And um, I had seen like trick tip tutorials for, for skateboarding and stuff. And so I was like, all right, well, since I created this shot, it was actually on Crash. It wasn't on Rust, uh, the first one. And then the first one that I hit in public match was on Scrapyard. But when I created this tutorial, I was like, people got to see like how I'm doing this. So I put the camera to, to my controller. And I think that's why I got so many views. Cause like people kept going back to see how your hands. Yeah. Um, and that was it. I just wanted like a, a shot. I wanted to create a shot that was really cool, simple and clean, but like very like stylish. And that's how the temper shot was created. The, the guy, I think they, they all remember. They even speak in the chat about their gris and stuff. It's amazing. Je vais prendre juste rapidement le relais d'Alice sur ce coup parce qu'il y a eu beaucoup de termes techniques. Mais en gros, il expliquait qu'à l'époque du temper shot, il voulait un trick shot un peu différent. Et c'est comme ça qu'il s'était dit, je vais aller en privé sur Rust, etc. Je vais essayer de créer un truc cool, simple, clean et efficace. Et pour tous ceux qui suivent et qui connaissent le temper shot, vous savez que c'était de la frappe. Et à côté de ça, bah, c'est devenu très populaire. C'est ce que j'expliquais, le tutoriel du temper shot avait 6 millions de vues. C'était une dinguerie. Et uh, I really think that the, the temper shot really became one of the, the most iconic trick shots. And when uh, the phase hill comes and stuff, like, started to become more and more popular, phase started to have more and more members and stuff, um, how did you live, it, like, what was the mindset inside the structure at uh, that time when it started to grow up and what, get what bigger? What was the mindset bigger? inside the what? Inside the, I said the structure, but inside the team, sorry. Inside the team? For, for just expanding? Past? Yes. Well, starting to see like success, views, more and more, more, and more members, more, more and more following and stuff. One thing I wanted to mention too, just like that was really important for that time was um, the thing about Ilcam, so that was cool. Like for us to, we had to put music in our videos and it, it couldn't be copywritten music. It had to be like, like uncopyrighted music. And so, I would go to these websites like underground hip hop and like all these other websites to find like new music and um, we're the gym. Yeah. And we were able to like, um, I found out about like logic early on, like when logic had like 30,000 views on his videos, you know, and, um, and I was like, yo, this music is sick. And so I, I DM'd, I reached out to him on Twitter and I was like, yo, do you mind if we use your music in our videos? And he was like, yeah, go for it. And like back then we had a like, much bigger following than him at the time on, on our social medias. And like, we put his music in our videos and like the ill cams and stuff. And like, it was popping off. Like people loved it, right? People loved it. And uh, I discovered the logic that way. Yeah. In the chat, they even speak about Macklemore too. Yeah, Macklemore too. I was going to bring him next. Macklemore, Fortune Family, 
you know, um, big shout out to those guys. You know, like we, we kind of like we're all growing at the same time and, and we were able to help each other. And so it was cool. Um, developed some cool relationships and stuff. But um, for us to transcend that, because it went after Black Ops 2, like Black Ops 2 was the next big Call of Duty that came out. Um, and we like low key dropped the ball on it that year. Like we weren't doing as much as we, we should have. Um, that was the year when I was like very inactive. I was just like away from the scene and stuff. Cause I was, you know, I was 18. Okay. Just got, like got my own place now. I'm like, had a girlfriend for the first time. I'm, I just was. The college stuff too. You said yeah, the, the college stuff. And I was just very away from the scene. Like okay. I, that, that year for me, I was kind of like, and so, um, Phase wasn't operating the right way. Like it was kind of getting bad. And like then uh, um, like Seabass was helping out and then like uh, it, it just wasn't wasn't going the way that it should have. And that's around the time where like Apex and Banks came to me and they were like, yo, like, like we need to fix this. And so around that time, like um, I, I realized like Apex and Banks are people I can really trust and like Rely I, need, I need them. I need them closer. And so um Banks ended up actually moving in because when, when my roommate at the time moved out, Banks moved in. This was February of 2014. Okay. Banks moved in. Uh, Rain had also come in too around like, it was Apex, it was, um, Apex, Banks, and Rain. And those are the people I would talk to the most like, and then like Seabass. And, uh, and so um, Banks moved in February 2014. And the goal for when he first moved in was like for us to get a house together. Yes. And this ended up being the first ever content house on YouTube. Like no one did it before us, right? Um, and by November, we had accomplished that. And like our goal was to live in California. We had our sponsor, g at the time. They were based in Long Island in New York. And they offered us this house that like they were going to pay for. It was a nice house. And, oh. and we're at the time, we're like, We don't got to pay for it. All right, this is this is great. Yeah, like you had the whole uh, house whole free and paid for yeah. by G Fuel. And so <clears throat> and so it was like me, Banks, Apex, Rain, uh, Adapt, Blaziken, um, and then Tico, and then Sensei even for a little bit. And it was like <laughs> it was madness, bro. Like It's, that house was. That's when because um, for a while Phase was on the decline, right? And then and then we all moved in together, and. Boom. Straight like back was, up. Yeah, that was like when we were making content every day. We all had G7Xs, like the cameras. Yes. We're all... The classic, the Sony uh, G G7 power shot. Uh. Exactly. <laughs> every morning we would wake up, like eat breakfast together, talk about what videos we're making, like collaborate. We're like, all right, uh, can you help me? Like we'd all help each other with the videos. And so we'd all be in the videos together. And like, that's what people love to see. They love that. Like that was the first time where we went from gameplay to then... There was commentary over the gameplay, and that was the first time you heard us. And then I think I was the first person in the, in the gaming to scene show. to show my face. And that I put out a day in the life video, and it was my 100th video or 100K video. And I just, I remember I was a senior in high school, just showed my whole day from when I woke up at 6 a.m., went to school. I filmed all that and um, came back home, skated for a little bit, then played Call of Duty. And like that was the, First time a gamer showed their face and stuff. And I, then from then on, people started doing that more and more. Um, phase became less of a group channel and people started making their own individual channels. And so at that point, it was like, that's when Phase was starting to die because people were just bringing their channels to life. And of course. there wasn't an incentive for people to uh, like post to Phase as much anymore. So we just kind of like, like we're posting ill cams and stuff, but that was about it. And it's, so, it's when uh, you, are, you are in a music group, you do it for the group, but then if you have a solo career, exactly. you want to just grind a little bit for your yeah, exactly. solo career. Yeah, you, and at the end, the group uh, don't have that see, much song anymore. Yeah, you see, you see more money doing stuff by yourself, and then you're like, yeah, you know what? Um, so that was kind of the thing. And then we moved in the house together. Everything blew up. Like we were starting to like every single day, we'd get millions of views. Like posting videos, we're getting millions and millions of views. So it was crazy. That time was uh, one of the most memorable times uh, in, in FaZe Clan's career. I feel like a lot of people found out about us th then more than even like before. So it's like, if you knew about us before, like that's sick. because it's been 12 plus years, man. It's been, you know what I'm saying? Like it's been a long, long, crazy 
wild journey. Definitely, when you spoke about the house, even in the chat, a lot of people said, oh, the vlogs and stuff. Yeah. The French viewership was already following this. Alice, il a parlé un petit peu de l'époque, de la première phase house, etc. Si tu veux nous récapituler tout ça pour nos amis qui ne comprennent pas. Yes, et je vais même revenir un tout petit peu avant parce qu'il a même mentionné un truc sur les Hillcams tout à l'heure qui était ouais. hyper intéressant. C'est qu'il qu qu s'était euh, inspiré euh, des vidéos de skateboard en fait. C'est ça. Qu'il faisait du skateboard. Et en fait, il voulait un peu garder ce même truc où tu avais de la musique derrière en fond et qu'en fait, t'expliquais comment tu faisais euh, les moves et tout. Et du coup, euh, en fait, c'est comme ça que lui, quand il éditait les Hillcams, il voulait vraiment que ça, ça, ça ressemble à un peu comme ces vidéos de, de skateboard. Ouais, quoi. les petits montages de skate, etc., époque 2010. Ouais, c'est ça. Et après, en fait, après, il a parlé du temper shot du coup, parce que c'était un peu ta, ta question après qui avait fait plus de 6 millions de vues quoi je crois si, si je me trompe pas ouais c'est ça et que en fait euh, sur le tuto il montrait avec sa manette parce qu'il voulait vraiment que les gens puissent voir un peu comment ça se faisait et tout et en fait bah, ça a un peu genre lancé le truc et ouais, après en voyant les gens ses mains que ça a vraiment tout, aidé quoi. de fou ouais Ouais c'est ça et en fait après euh, ce qui était spécial aussi sur les Hillcams pour lui c'était vraiment le fait que en fait il passait vraiment beaucoup de temps sur les edits parce qu'il fallait trouver de la musique qui n'était pas copyrightée Exactement. et euh, du coup il y a eu des petits artistes enfin petits entre guillemets parce que maintenant comme Michael Moore ou Logic qui à l'époque se sont, enfin pas se sont servis du buzz, mais ont eu du buzz grâce aux vidéos de, de, de Faze et les Ilkans, et qui après bah, ont décollé quoi, parce que maintenant c'est des noms que nous on connaît super bien quoi. Franchement, c'est euh... un truc de ouf parce que désolé Ali, je t'ai coupé rapido, ouais, mais il faut se rendre compte quand même que vraiment Faze avec ces musiques là, I'm telling uh, uh, them how Faze uh, helped Logic and Michael Mort to get more and more popular, mais vraiment à l'époque les amis, Faze avait eu une influence énorme sur le fait que ces rappeurs là réussissent à derrière construire une carrière. Je te, je te relaisse Alice. Ouais et ensuite après il a enchaîné du coup sur Black Ops 2 donc il disait qu'à ce moment là il avait 18 ans qu'il était un peu moins actif un peu plus loin de la scène et qu'en fait Face coulait un petit peu parce que chacun avait vu qu'il pouvait faire un peu sa carrière perso ça. et du coup ils faisaient chacun leurs vidéos de leur côté parce qu'ils avaient l'impression que ça générait plus d'argent et en fait bah lui il avait ses trucs avec l'école comme on en a parlé un peu tout à l'heure et du coup, bah, Face, bah, ça coulait un petit peu, quoi. C'était un peu en déclin. Exactement. Et euh, t'as Apex et Banks qui sont venus lui parler en lui disant Écoute, mec, il faut vraiment qu'on sauve le truc, c'est pas possible qu'on qu ouais. perde ça. Et euh, du coup, Banks s'est installé avec lui en février 2014. Et il lui a dit Écoute, faut qu'on prenne une maison. On a le sponsor, donc euh, G Fuel, qui leur a offert une super maison en Californie. Exactement, G Fuel leur a donné une maison tout frais payée comme ça, une dinguerie. Ouais, ça se met bien. Hein. Et du coup, ils se sont dit, bah, on va faire, euh, on va faire du content un peu euh, sur la vie euh, qu'on fait. On va mettre en, mettre en scène nos journées, on va montrer nos têtes et tout. Et en fait, euh, ça a relancé le truc euh, de fou. Et ils pensent que c'est à ce moment-là que les gens ont vraiment commencé à connaître Face et ça. à voir un peu leurs vidéos, quoi. Parce que du coup, ça fait plus de 12 ans quand même. Exactement. C'est grâce en partie à la Face House et le fait qu'ils ont commencé à se lever le matin, discuter entre eux, faire du contenu avec la caméra, tout ça, faire des collaborations sur les chaînes des uns des autres, que ça, ça a vraiment explosé. We are gonna speak uh, about uh, the Face House when you started uh, to do some more uh, like in real life content and stuff. But just before, I have one question uh, because it's the French community, so they really want to know. Okay. Do, do you remember back then the only French speaking player or member that Faze had? Anil. Anil! Yeah, Anil. Faze Wartek, you remember Wartek, him? Wartek, of course, man. Yeah, shout out to him, bro. He was a legend. Did That's you notice at the time uh, that uh, the, the power of the French community when you when he came to yeah, Faze? Yeah, for sure. No, we definitely felt it. There was always, listen, France has always shown mad love. There's always a lot of a lot of numbers in France, bro. You guys, like, you guys remind me of my, my country of origin, Brazil. Like, it's, there's a lot of passion, you know? Very, a lot of passion in France. And you see that, you see that with the people, you see that with the sports, you see that with, with the, with the artists and stuff. Um, another guy too that was around that time that I got to meet, which was really cool. He he never like worked with us, but he did. He actually uh, created um, my Times of Temper intro. Yes. A lot of people don't know this, but do you remember Never? Never? Do you know he still works? Yeah. And he's working, I think, with Gotaga. Wow. Corentin, he's hey. still around. Yo, Never. Never, bah oui. Never's the man too, man. He's sick. He's sick, bro. Never MVM or something like he's, yes, yes, he's yes. sick, bro. <laughs> bro. Just look at the reaction from the chat when you yeah, spoke about yeah, let's go, chat. and Never. <laughs> bro, listen, Never, Wartech, legends. Legends, absolute legends. Um, uh, Gotaga too. I, I didn't know too much about Gotaga, but I, I know enough about him. Uh, Gotaga, yes, now he's still in the scene. He's still doing some things. And it was really, really skilled. I, I didn't know that Never made your intro. Yeah. Uh, he, he did. What did he, he was working as an editor for Phase? No, he just did his own stuff. I think at the time he was doing a lot of like calisthenic stuff, like he was doing like some sick stuff in the yes. park and stuff. 
and I'd see his edits and I, he just, I knew him as this, this like really skilled editor. So I was like, I, I saw that he made intros and stuff. And I think, I don't know if he offered it to me or if I asked him, but he made the intro to Times of Temper and uh, it came out. It was iconic, you know, with All I Do in the Background by Logic. Um, yeah. Amazing, amazing. You spoke about the uh, the house, the face house, the first one in California, uh, which uh, made you um, like start to switch. Uh, you a little bit, uh, the members started uh, slowly dropping a little bit Call of Duty and uh, doing more and more in real life content. Yeah. Uh, these contents were like uh, uh, pumping. We, we are gonna be real. You talk about it yourself. Um, Why uh, did you make that turn? Uh, did you feel like that Call of Duty was a little bit dying? Yeah. Was it the vibe? Was it maybe even the game Call of Duty Ghost at that time? Yeah. Was yeah, it no. a mix of everything? Call of Duty wasn't wasn't the same. You know, we played Modern Warfare 2 for like two to three years. Like we tried to play it for like the fourth year and it was just like, all right. No, the fourth year was when Black Ops 2 came out. Then we played that for like two years. And then it was just like, Ghost is just not it. And you know, like at the time it just didn't make sense. We needed something that to revitalize FaZe. Like we yes. needed to put FaZe back on the map. Like we needed that energy back. And so um, it was actually uh, Banks's idea to, to move into a house together. And shout out to Banks, bro. That's like one of my best friends. That's my fucking brother till, till forever. You know, shout out all the guys, you know, Apex and Rain. Um, but like when Banks first moved into the apartment with me, that like, that was one of the most fun times because we're both very like-minded, you know? Um, And we had a lot of fun too, but we, we would wake up and we would work every day. We'd talk about phase. We'd talk about like, he'd be like in the shower and I'd be like, bro, like, what are we titling this video? You know, like, like it was very uh, intimate. It was very intimate. We had a lot of fun too. Um, I don't know how, uh, <laughs> I don't know how, like, I don't, I don't know about your podcast, if it's PG or not, uh, like. No, no, you can go. You can go about it. You anything? can go, you can bro, go. Right, no, so no gotta, PG, just I gotta, I gotta go. Tell you, I gotta tell you this story. Let's go, I want to hear this, that story. This is funny. So uh, when, when Banks first moved in, well, he, uh, when Banks first moved in, like I knew Banks was like a little crazy, but I didn't realize how crazy he was. Like right? that like, much. Um, but this, this situation wasn't like crazy, crazy. It was just funny. So we threw a party the first day. Okay. That he, he came over, uh, that he moved in. And at the time he had a girlfriend and uh, like he ended up like that night, he ended up get, getting with the, his girl and another girl. And then he, he slid me a girl too, like a different girl. And I was like, all right, bet, you know, like, <laughs> that's how it works. You know what I mean? That real brotherly love type. And, uh, but um, we had a lot of fun in those apartment days. It was, it was cool. Um, and then when we moved in the house, like the main thing, the biggest takeaway from FaZe is that like, you know, whether it's FaZe Clan in general or, or the, the house, is that we're a bunch of like-minded people from all different walks of life, but we're a very like-minded And we moved into a place together because we all shared the same vision. We all believed, we all like shared a very similar love and passion for FaZe Clan. And we saw this vision when other people didn't. Okay. You know, all the people that um, probably thought we were fucking crazy playing video games all the time and like making videos are like, yeah, you're never going to do anything with your life. Like, you know, so they go to school, they do all of their stuff. They go to a normal job and stuff. And like, I don't know, like I, I had no idea what it was that I was wanted to do with my life. That's why I tried to go to school and I realized it wasn't for me. You know, I, I was going to school for business, but it was taking me away from my business and it made no sense. And uh, I didn't learn shit about business. I just learned like, I don't know, it was and, traditional. And this math test. Uh... I hate it. Yeah, fuck this math test. <laughs> Yo, bro. Fuck this math test. Um, but yeah, it was just, uh, it was great. That time in New York, it was very candid. It was very natural. There was nothing forced. You know, we were the first ones to do it. And back then, the, the game on YouTube was, it was so free compared to how it is now. Now there's like, you, the most important things about creating a YouTube video is the title and the thumbnail of a video. Yes. Back then, it didn't fucking matter what the title and the thumbnail was. Like, people like appreciated your content. But now it's like, if, if the title isn't clickbait enough and the thumbnail isn't clickbait enough, you're going to get a lot less views. You're in a competition with a lot of other creators who have a lot of money too. So they have and, a and big with, production team and stuff. It's and with YouTube, because if it's not good enough, they're not going to put it in the algorithm. Nope. So it's like... YouTube can decide like the life and death of your content. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's so different now. The algorithms change. It's just the whole game has changed. Mr. Beast really set a crazy fucking, you know what I'm saying? Like he put the bar so high, you know what I mean? <laughs> Shout out to him. Um, 
But yeah, that's, that's, that's generally it. Eh ben, on a eu, je crois, Alice, une certaine histoire assez marrante. Ouais, euh, alors du coup, euh, ils disaient qu'en fait, euh, s'ils avaient commencé à faire du content un peu plus euh, genre euh, lifestyle et tout sur leur vie, en fait, c'est parce que pour eux, euh, Call of Duty, bah, ça avait changé quoi. Avec la sortie de Ghost, c'était différent. C'est ça. Avant, ils avaient passé euh, des années à jouer euh, aux autres jeux, puis enfin maintenant, c'était plus pareil quoi. Puis il fallait un peu se réinventer, recréer une synergie chez Phase. Et euh, du coup, grâce à Banks, avec euh, toutes ses idées, c'est comme ça qu'ils avaient réussi à faire euh, leur content euh, vidéo. C'est ça. Donc lui, en fait, il en garde un super bon souvenir. Et du coup, il racontait que euh, quand Banks s'est installé chez lui, genre, il savait qu'il était fou, il le savait, mais il savait pas encore à quel point. Puis après, tout de suite, il nous a demandé s'il pouvait le dire, hein, parce qu'on sait Dites-vous jamais... Dites-vous qu'il si a demandé France, si sur le stream, on pouvait parler de ça ou pas. Je lui ai dit, mec, fonce alors la petite histoire croustillante, c'est que du coup le premier soir, donc Banks venait juste d'arriver, ils se sont dit qu'ils allaient faire une petite fête là avec euh, tout le monde. Et à cette époque, donc Banks avait une copine et il l'a amené dans sa chambre avec une autre fille et ils se sont bien amusés. Et Banks lui a ramené à, à, à Temper une, une fille de son côté. Il, il lui a dit c'est bon bro, vas-y. Il lui a tiens, fait une passe décisive heureux. comme ça. <rire> Iniesta. <rire> et c'est là qu'il a capté qu'il était complètement fou. Mais du coup, ce qu'il adore en fait avec, avec Banks, c'est qu'en fait, ils ont exactement la même vision des choses. Et en fait, tout le monde les pense un peu fou de leur côté, mais c'est les seuls qui ont réellement cru au projet et qui avaient une vision hyper exactement. commune de ce qu'ils voulaient. Et c'est grâce à ça un peu que ça, ça a sauvé le truc, quoi. Et une et vision disait... en plus assez tôt, ouais. Ouais, c'est ça, parce qu'il disait que maintenant, justement, euh, quand on voit un peu le niveau avec les vidéos de Mister Beast ou quoi que ce soit, ou l'algorithme de, de YouTube, c'est complètement différent, quoi. Parce que maintenant, si t'as pas le bon titre, si t'as pas la bonne minia, ça marche pas, quoi. Et à cette époque-là, tout le monde s'en foutait. Tu regardais le content parce que tu voulais t'amuser, tu voulais passer un bon moment, quoi. Exactement, exactement. Et Alice, je tiens à dire, vraiment, tu fais des travaux de zinzin dans le chat. Gros respect à Alice, parce que ce qu'elle fait pour rendre l'émission... Nickel, j'en suis super content. Je trouve que ça casse même pas le rythme et tout. Moi, j'aime beaucoup. Alors, something, uh, we spoke about uh, a little bit about uh, the, the the mindset and how we were working as a group together. Uh, I would say that like, so- something undeniable we face is the image uh, the image reflected by the lifestyle of the member, the the closing, the many projects you work on, the pimp- the people you hang out with. Uh, how would you describe this mindset and this lifestyle? So it's a great question. Over the last 12 years of doing this, I've realized that, you know, back when I thought I was just creating a team and, and a logo for the team, I didn't realize I was creating a brand, you know, like I, I would be in school every day, like thinking like, yo, we need a logo. And so like, I was just like, I ended up drawing the logo. I used like the font that was, that's that font over there. And then just like, kind of just uh, putting a backwards F and a C And bam, we got the logo, right? And then uh, I didn't realize that we were creating a brand. You know, I found that out later and I realized like, whoa, like this is way bigger than I've ever imagined it to be. Than just a team or a bunch of people. Right, it's just like, this is crazy. And it's like, we're, we're so many different moving parts, all sharing the same vision, but we're all putting in work. You know, we're all doing our, we're all doing our thing, but I, I've, Over the years, I learned that everything, everything that we do, the, the words we even choose to say, like the way we dress, you know, like the, how we move, like how we talk to people, how, how we communicate, the videos we make, like the style of the videos, like um, how, how it makes a person feel, like everything is your brand, right? Like that's your brand, like that is you. So when you, when you think about it like that, it's, it's a lot easier to understand So um, w- when I first found that out, I realized, okay, like we got to just like really show ourselves and our true colors in every single possible way, you know? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I always, I've always been a fan of fashion. Uh, I, know, I know a lot of us have, and like it's a, it's a way to express yourself. You yes. Know, I've always been a fan of art. Um, that's where like Ill Cams came in, uh, came in, like those montages, those big videos. Um, Like that's Times of Temper it was more, you know, it wasn't your traditional vlog. It was a more like flowy, had music and stuff. It was, um, does that answer your question? It's answering perfectly. I, I feel it because it's, uh, the, the way you expressed it, like you showed it in, I would say in public, it was, uh, at the time it was, I'm not going to say it in a negative way, but it was selling it dreams. Yeah. It was selling dream to, I think, a hundred of thousands of people who were like, okay, 
this lifestyle, this way, um, this way of being yourself, this way of maybe putting this clothes or listening to that kind of music or partying like this and this stuff. It's little bit, it puts some stars in the eye of a lot of people, I yeah. think. Yeah, absolutely. I think the biggest takeaway for all this is that, and it's as cheesy as it sounds, like it's the most real thing I've ever known is you can do anything you set your mind to. And the only limits that you have are the ones that you place on yourself. So break free of those limits, have no limits, just don't aim for the sky, aim for like, don't aim for the moon, aim for a fucking different galaxy. You know what I'm saying? Like, because regardless if you get there or not, you're going to get a lot further than you would if you're just aiming for, you know, the sky or the ceiling. Like, you know, like you got to think big and just have, you can't have any doubts. Like think about the most important conversation that you're ever going to have is the one that you have right here every single day, every single second. All the words that you choose to be in here will affect everything, will change your life. Oh là 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 là. Les amis, on est sur de la motivation pure et dure, n'est-ce pas Alice Ouais, exactement. Parce que du coup, il disait que quand il avait créé le logo de, de Face, pour lui, en fait, il se rendait pas compte que ça allait devenir une image de marque. C'est ça. Et qu'en fait, tout ce qu'il y avait derrière, toutes les actions, tout, tout ce qu'il disait, en fait, même tout ce qu'il portait, en fait, ça avait un impact sur ce que les gens voyaient et la manière dont ils le percevaient. Exactement. Et donc, pour lui, en fait, ça a été direct. En fait, il s'est dit, il faut qu'on soit authentique, il faut qu'on soit nous-mêmes, que ça soit naturel, que les gens nous aiment pour ce qu'on est, quoi. Et après, alors là, il est parti dans son motivational speech, là, vous êtes The prêts. motivational <rire> speech was insane. Even in the chat, they were saying, wow. <rire> donc, pour ceux qui l'ont pas eu en anglais, donc ce qu'il disait, c'est qu'en fait, bah, tu peux tout faire. La seule limite, c'est celle que tu te mets toi-même. Et qu'en fait, il faut continuer à viser toujours plus haut, que ce soit le ciel, les galaxies. Parce que même si t'arrives pas où tu veux aller, au moins t'avances. Et même, enfin, tout ce que tu fais, au moins, ça, ça a un but précis. Et que chaque mot a des actions et que du coup, si tu veux te lancer, il faut te lancer, il faut pas se mettre de limites. Exactement, magnifique. Merci pour ça, Alice. I wanted to have a, like a, 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 to, to go in a different angle. Uh, when I made my research, I saw that uh, you were from Brazil, okay. And uh, when I started to like dig a little bit into this, uh, I got the feeling that uh, you started in 2015, 2016, a little bit uh, that you tried to to get. I think it's a feeling that you try to get closer to your country by, I, I think, maybe going there more often, uh, by putting it like in a spotlight in your videos and stuff. Uh, we know the pride of the Brazilian community. Can you tell, tell us maybe a little bit about your relationship with your country? Yeah, uh, I love my country. I love my country so much, man. I got so much love for Brazil and um, it taught me, it, it taught me, it made me who I am today. The passion that you, you see from me came from my country there's the people are so passionate they're incredibly passionate um they love what they do you know like i i started playing soccer as soon as i came out the womb you know like i was um um football you know for all the people correcting in the football. chat <laughs> all the people correcting in the chat listen. european crowd football <laughs> it not is football soccer. it is football listen i don't know what america's doing over here talking about whatever you know we don't got to get in <laughs> but um that's the real football um but it's I felt disconnected from from Brazil. Okay. And like I after I think, all these years in the USA. Yeah, because I went, I got, I tr moved from Brazil when I was seven, and then I didn't go back until I was twelve. And during that time, I only spoke English because I needed to learn English, and I wanted to teach my mom English. More importantly, like, like I like she needed the help, so I only speak in English. Of course. And so by the time I went back when I was twelve, I had like forgotten a lot of my Portuguese and so I went back and I was like not only was I like a shy kid but I was also I couldn't I didn't know what to say so yes. I'd be mute it would be hard I'd just be standing there like not knowing what to say and so then that's when I realized the importance of speaking another language and making sure that I'm practicing it and I'm refining it so anytime I speak with my mom like 95% of the time I'm speaking in Portuguese, Portuguese. And if I'm speaking with my brother or anybody that speaks the language, I practice it and I speak Portuguese because that's how I keep it sharp. It's better than it's ever been now, um, but it's still not 100%. And yeah. I want it to be 100%. I want it to, you know, but uh, it'll get there. And then uh, I want to learn some other languages too. I definitely want to learn more French. I want to be able to converse 
fluently in French. Like, next time we speak, bro, I'm going to be a little better. Uh, in me. French next yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next time. C'est ce je promets. I promise. Je promets. Voilà, il nous hey, a promis que la prochaine fois, il parlera bien français. J'ai en France. <laughs> If you come to France, just send me a message. I'll get you. Uh, I'll, it's my country. Okay. You. You, you will be welcome very well. Ah, oh, thank you, brother. Merci beaucoup. De rien. De rien. Um, but yeah, so from when I was 12 to 19, I hadn't gone back to Brazil. So I was extremely disconnected. Like, because those years, that's your, that's, that's like your real childhood, right? Like, that's like, I mean, your first half of your childhood and then your adolescence. Like, that was when... I forgot, like, I, I was not speaking to my family. <clears throat> and I grew up distant from them. <clears throat> Excuse me. I grew up distant from my family uh, in Brazil because I was just with my mom. And so I, uh, it was hard for me to, like, I, I just wasn't talking with them. And so from that time, I spoke barely to any of them. And then when I went back to Brazil, it was around Christmas time. And I go back and uh, like my mom and my dad's side of the family, they had like, whether it was, because my mom had a farm and stuff and the farm, they had like a big like, like letter in the, in the front showing a lot of pictures of my aunt and stuff and me and like, um, just like, it was very friendly. And then when I went to um, my dad's side, there was like a big, they had like a big like family, like Christmas party. And there was like a, like welcome Thomas and like, like really big and, There, then there was like another uh, like letter and stuff, like a big poster that they all signed it. They wrote like some amazing things and then they, everyone in the family signed it. And, and so I'm just like, wow, I, I completely forgot about this family. The you know, emotions like, it put. Yeah, uh, it, you know, like, and, uh, and so it's just, it, it took me back and I, I got so much love for, for, for my family and I so much love for my people because that, that Brazil is like, it's amazing. You know, like, I mean, it's, It's granted it's corrupt, right? If you live there, it's it's kind of you know like they're dealing with a lot of a lot of politics, a lot of bad stuff. It's yeah, I know there's the presidential like truly. It's, it's kind it's kind of corrupt, you know. Um, and that's the bad parts of it. But aside from that, it's an amazing place, it's a beautiful country, beautiful people, and uh, food's great, you know. And and the sports are great, and so that's that's where I, I just I just. I will always have a, a deep love for, for my country, man. Always. S someone asked in the chat, uh, will you go to the major, uh, the CSGO major in Rio? Yeah, I'll be in the major. Come on, I have. Come on, this is the biggest gaming event. For me, it's the biggest, this is like the World Cup of, you know, of video games for me. Because CSGO, there's no game that I can watch like CSGO. CSGO is the ultimate for me. Like that's like the real, like, that's as close to like football, For me, it's like bigger than that because I, I, I enjoy watching CS and um, man, CSGO gets me fucking going, bro. Same. Oh, I love CS. CSGO, yeah. I love League of Legends as well, but CSGO, dude, it has a special feeling. Yeah, it's like, and, and it's so good because like the games will be like an emotional roller coaster. It'll be like this and then this, like whatever team you're supporting, it's, it'll be back to back close, like overtime, double overtime, triple overtime, like, like oh my God, man. I, CS is the shit. And, and, like, and Face finally put a great result uh, bro, with uh, your roster, actually. We, we got the best team in the world right now. We, like, this year is like, we are that team. And in 2000, uh, 2018, we were, we were kind of that team, but we, we lost a major. It was a heartbreaking major. It was in uh, Boston. The Boston E-League major against Cloud9 in the final. The, the only event my mom ever went to. <sighs> my mom was, was there. My uh, my hometown friends were there, and like we lost. Like, man, it was kind of low key. Listen, like Cloud9 had a little advantage. Like they had more fans there because it's like a North American team, we're a European team, and uh, I don't know. Listen, it's, it's all good though. Like all love, we lost. You know what I'm saying? But, <laughs> we still see the trauma. But, but you know, but I remember Skadoodle getting the little little peeks from the the audience, being like, oh, you know, um. It is what it is. Now we got the best team in the world. We won the three biggest tournaments this year. It was uh, Katowice. Then we won the major. The major. That was our first major in Antwerp. And then we won uh, uh, Belgium. No, not Belgium. Sorry, Germany. It was uh, Cologne. Yes. Cologne was crazy. We beat Navi when we were, uh, they beat us. Like So they were like number one. And then we played them in the finals, which was the craziest finals ever. Did you watch that one? No. Bro, the craziest CSGO finals in history. Really? Oh, yeah. That's much? Oh, yeah. It was, okay. bro, it was back and forth. Like, 
anybody, it was anybody's game. And then it went to the fifth map because it was 2 2. Crazy. It was crazy. Um, ha, la, la, shout, la, out, la. shout out my guys, bro. Shout out Kerrigan, Rain, uh, Twist, and uh, Brokey, and uh, who am I forgetting? Rops, bro. Rops. Yeah. Rops. I loved just little uh, say. Uh, I love the, how uh, you uh, introduced Rops as a phase member with the video that yeah. uh, you found uh, where uh, he made an application a couple years ago. For phase five. For the Dude, phase he was, five. He was a Call of Duty player. Like, no one does that. He's, that kid's special, bro. Like, the fact that he was a big Call of Duty player, switched over to Counter-Strike, and now he's playing at the highest level against people that have been playing the game for 10, 15 years. So that's... that's Crazy. Je parlais parce que Rob ça, est un membre, de, enfin, un membre de Face pardon, euh, du roster CSGO qui gagne tout en ce moment. Et en fait, ils avaient fait une vidéo pour euh, lui, euh, faire son introduction. Euh, sorry. <rire> it's, sorry, sorry. it's the time you're getting up. Non, non, non. Non, <rire> non, non, non. En fait, son réveil a sonné, il est 15h30. Oh. Oh, non, non, non. You're waking up kind of late. Oh. <rire> Never, non, non, non. non. Or... Donc, en that, gros, that was before, not anymore. <rire> it's fine, it's fine. <rire> But, euh, du coup, en fait, je lui disais, Rob, ils avaient fait une jolie vidéo, etc., pour l'introduire en montrant euh, quand il y a quelques années, quand il était gamin, il avait essayé de rentrer dans Face déjà, donc c'était les émotions. Alice, est-ce que tu peux nous mettre au parfum de ce qui a été dit, s'il te plaît Ouais, bien sûr. Euh, alors, je rebondis un petit peu sur euh, le Brésil, parce que du coup, tu lui bien avais sûr, demandé, fonce, fonce. Euh, lui, qu'est-ce euh, qu que c'était un peu sa relation avec, euh, avec son pays, sachant qu'il l'avait quitté euh, quand il était hyper jeune et qu'il avait essayé un peu plus, euh, quand il était un peu plus vieux, donc Exactement. il y a quelques années, de l'introduire dans ses vidéos, de faire des vlogs, d'avoir un rapport un peu plus... Euh, un peu plus à la communauté quoi. C'est ça. Et du coup, il disait que donc lui, bah, son pays, c'est, il l'adore quoi. C'est là d'où vient sa passion. Pour lui, il est passionné comme tous les Brésiliens et tout. Euh, il joue au foot depuis qu'il est tout petit, donc il y a vraiment pour lui une, une vraie, une vraie connexion. Et au football, et euh... pas au soccer. Ouais, au football, hein, pas soccer, on est d'accord. Hein. Et euh, du coup, il disait qu'en fait, quand il était jeune, bah, comme il avait déménagé à Boston et que lui et sa mère, ils parlaient pas hyper bien anglais, il faisait l'effort de parler anglais tout le temps. C'est ça. Et pour sa mère, quoi, pour, pour qu'elle puisse, qu puisse apprendre. Et du coup, lui, il avait perdu beaucoup au portugais parce qu'il bah, il pratique, il pratiquait plus du tout, en fait. Et quand il est revenu euh, à ses 19 ans, il est revenu euh, à la période de, de Noël. Et en fait, il n'avait pas vu sa famille depuis des années. Et à chaque fois qu'il faisait des voyages, bah, il parlait presque pas parce que il avait un peu peur, quoi. Il était hyper timide et tout. Et en fait, à Noël, il allait dans la famille de son père qu'il avait pas vu depuis des années. Il avait même oublié qu'il y avait certaines personnes de sa famille. C'est ça. Et il disait que ils avaient fait une énorme pancarte avec genre euh, welcome, euh, welcome Tommy, tu vois. Ouais, genre, ils avaient tous euh, signé et tout. tout C'était ouais. les émotions. Ouais, ils avaient mis des petits mots et tout, et puis il s'est dit, wow, l'hospitalité euh, brésilienne, ça me, ça me manque vraiment. Et il disait que c'était un super beau pays, qu'il y avait une bonne gastronomie, qu'il y avait vraiment euh, beaucoup de, de bons sports et tout. Mais bon, le problème, c'était que c'était hyper corrompu, mais que ça reste quand même bah, son pays de cœur, quoi. Donc, euh, Exactement. il le gardera toujours. Et on parlait un petit peu ensuite de CSGO, il disait à quel point il adore CSGO, comment c'était plein d'émotions ce jeu, et qu'il irait bien évidemment au Major de Rio. Le frérot de Solari qui a posé la question dans le chat, n'hésitez pas. D'ailleurs, si vous avez des petits points à des moments, j'ai le chat sous les yeux, je pourrais les poser, tout c'est cool. Tommy, uh, I have to say that the people in the chat, they love the, the show. They, they love all your answers, answers and stuff. There is a good vibe. Hey, shout out chat, man. We love chat. Uh, we love the chat. We love the chat. In 2017, uh, Fortnite was relieved, uh, released, sorry, and uh, FaZe really got really into it. Uh, it was a sort of uh, rebirth for the structure and the love of Of like people who played it. Uh, first, have you played it? And how important and successful was this game for FaZe? Fortnite is one of the greatest games ever created. You know, I'll start off by saying that because that was the only game that you could compare to the impact that Modern Warfare 2 made. And honestly, with Fortnite, there were more kids that played Fortnite because, you know, there's just more kids as time went on, there's more kids, younger kids on the internet. Like internet is much easier to get than, than it was 12 years ago. Yes, so, definitely. Uh, or at the time it was seven years ago because Fortnite came out in 2017. I was playing Modern Warfare 2 in 2009, late 2009. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Fortnite was incredible. Fortnite revitalized gaming. And for me, and I think for a lot of people, that's when gaming became cool. When when Drake played with Ninja. That's when gaming entered the mainstream. Period. You know what I'm saying? Like, Period. before that, if you were a gamer, like, you're just some nerd. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you're, you're a gamer. Like, you play video games. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then Drake got on with Ninja. I remember I was watching Breaking Bad with, uh, I was watching Breaking Bad at the time. 
And uh, I got a notification on my phone on Twitch saying Ninja, because I followed him, playing with Drake. I'm like, what? It was this moment I remembered like 9-11. You know how like some moments you just remember like, because it's so crazy. So um, What you were doing, uh, what yeah. you were watching, yeah, which I was day. Watching, <laughs> I was watching Breaking Bad with my ex. We're chilling in bed. And then all of a sudden this notification pops up on my phone. I'm like, huh? Immediately I switched the TV, put on Drake playing with Ninja. And then uh, I'm living, at the time I was living in this house in LA. It was me, Adapt, uh, Nikon, um, I think like a few other people. I'm, I'm forgetting the names, but, uh, and I'll get to one of them in a second. So Drake was playing with Ninja and I'm just like, wow, this is unbelievable. I can't, I can't believe I'm watching this right now. This is crazy. Like these worlds are colliding, like finally colliding. I didn't think it was going to happen this soon, but it's happening. And then... And then all of a sudden, Travis Scott jumps on. Hey, shout out to you, Scott, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> Travis Scott jumps in the game, right? You spoke about my dunks, but uh, yeah. yours are really cool as well. Huh? Thank you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, hey, no, dunks are my favorite favorite shoes. They're the sickest, bro. Dunks are the... Anyways. So then it's Drake and Travis Scott playing with Ninja. And then all of a sudden, Juju Smith-Schuster, a uh, wide receiver for the Steelers at the time, right? Uh, fo American football player. He jumps on and like he was having problems set up his stream. And I'm like watching this like, bro, this is crazy. And then I realized like, wait a minute. Juju is, is off season. He's living with us right now. He's just down the, he's down the, the hallway. I can go help him set up his stream. So I'm like, oh, wait, let me go help him. You went? I, go, <laughs> I, I went to his room. I'm like, yo, let me help you set up your stream. We helped him set up his stream. And then he was good. His mic was good. His camera was good. He was chilling. Um, and I'm just, then I go back to my room and I'm watching this like, bro, this is crazy. That was monumental. That will, that was for me, uh, the day when gaming became mainstream. It was you, cool you to be a gamer. You instantly realized, like when you saw the Drake and stuff like you, yeah. that's the moment. Yeah. Because then ev after that moment, everybody was like, that was a closet gamer came out and like, they started posting like that they play video games and stuff. Like now it's, it's cool to be a gamer because Drake. Ah là là, Alice, raconte-leur cette histoire de Drake, je te, je te prie, s'il te plaît. <rire> euh, donc du coup, pour lui, ouais, il disait que Fortnite, c'était vraiment genre le jeu qui avait révolutionné le gaming. Quoi. Après, on n'était plus vus comme des, comme des gamers puants, on devenait un peu des gens cool avec Fortnite. C'est ça. Et euh, donc en fait, il racontait que bah, Banal, il regardait Breaking Bad dans son lit, euh, posé et tout. Puis d'un coup, il voit la notification Twitch de Ninja qui joue avec Drake sur Fortnite et il se dit... Euh, Waouh, attends, non, c'est pas possible, quoi. Donc, il a, il a carrément arrêté son épisode, il a mis direct le stream, et après, quand il a vu qu'il y avait même, genre, Travis Scott qui s'était mis, et euh, alors, j'ai pas le nom du joueur de football américain. Ah, il s'était Juju Juju ouais, de Juju Smith Schuster. Juju ouais. Smith Schuster. Voilà. Exactement, et du coup, euh, et il avait du mal à set up son stream, et euh, en fait, euh, Tamper, il s'est dit, mais en fait, le mec, il habite juste en bas de, de la rue, quoi, donc euh, il y est allé. Il a aidé à set up le stream, puis après, il est reparti peinard, et c'est à ce moment-là, pour lui, que vraiment, genre, Fortnite, ça a vraiment. Euh, propulser le gaming comme on l'a aujourd'hui et que c'est devenu un truc populaire et, euh, et cool et plus genre un truc euh, de geek boutonneux quoi. And what, what was the impact for FaZe uh, uh, when Fortnite was released and uh, you took your first uh, rosters I know that you had a lot of players, you had uh, Tifu, you had uh, mm -hmm. Mongral I think, maybe a couple more that I, I, I don't remember. What was the impact for the structure to have all these players that got really popular? It was crazy. Um... Shout out to Banks once again, because he found out about Tifu early on when Tifu had like five, 10, 25 viewers max on his stream. And at the time, because he knew, Banks knew Tifu's brother, uh, he goes by Savage on uh, Instagram. So Jack was his name. Um, he's like, yo, you should play with my brother. He's really good. And then like, I think he played with him once and then he watched his streams. And then he realized like, that he would naturally want to watch Tifu streams versus Ninjas. Because okay. he, he felt, he could tell Tifu was the better player. And so he's thinking like, like, why does Tifu not have all these views? Like, we should bring him on because he's cracked, you know? Like, he was like really insane. And so we brought in Tifu, um, we brought in Cloak too. And uh, I think Cloak was already a part of FaZe at the time. And uh, I think... When Banks wanted to bring in Tifu, like Cloak didn't want to play with him or something. Really? Yeah, in the very beginning, if I remember correctly, like Cloak didn't want to, did not want to play with him. It was like Cloak C, Jail Mock, and then I think there was one more person. But uh, then, you know, like they just started playing together and then they actually liked each other. And 
then we were li- like around that time we were living in these two we had these two mansions right like next to each other okay um big houses four like story houses there was a street that had four mansions all owned by the same guy and so we were renting two of them okay and then when we got the uh these places are crazy too it's like glass windows like like and there's just pools like there's a, a one of one of them has like a nightclub in there like a gym a um, nightclub a nightclub in the house yeah there's a uh, theaters in both Both houses, there's a stripper poles and shit. It's just, oh, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Attends, it's juste pause, quick translation, sorry. Il disait que dans leur maison à l'époque, il y avait des bars de striptease, des cinémas et des boîtes de nuit dans les maisons. It's crazy. Yeah, it was, it was mad, bro. It was mad. Uh, that was a fun time, but like, I'm glad we got out of there when we did. We, we like, Banks definitely spent more time in that house because he was in there for a year or so before, before we moved in there as like the phase house. And so with the cloud house, Banks was doing that stuff. Mm-hmm. So then uh, we had the, the Fortnite players. We had Tifu and, and, and Cloak. We wanted to move them into a house. So okay. we got the third house. So at one point we had these three mansions right next to each other. And uh, Out of the four uh, that the guy was renting. Yeah. And uh, Banks really took Tifu under, under his wing to like help him because he saw that all he was doing was playing Fortnite. And it's like, dude, you can't just, you can't really blow up just playing Fortnite. You know, like when the, if the game ends, Is your career over? So Banks got him a G7X. He taught him how to record videos, taught him how to vlog, and showed him the importance of it. Taught him how to like title his videos and thumbnail his videos. And so Banks helped build Tifu's brand. You know, like he helped, really helped build Tifu. And people got to see Turner. You know, Turner was a very, you know, like very athletic. Like he d- does a lot of like different stuff. It's kind of crazy. He jumps off of like 60 foot or 80 foot, he'll do like gainers, like backflips oh. off of like 80 foot into the water. Okay. I remember one time there was a, because we were living right next to this reservoir, the Hollywood Reservoir, and it's like 60 feet. And then he like convinced us all to do it. Like a lot of us did it. And I did it twice, I think. And that shit was scary as really? fuck, bro. 60 feet to the water? I was, I was shitting bricks, bro. I was like, <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm just, I'm just going to do it. Like, but I did, I really didn't want to do it. But I did it, I did it twice actually, but it was, That shit was scary as fuck. Uh, uh, je crois que 60 feet, it's approximately 20 meters, I think. C'est 18 mètres, exactement. 18 même. mètres. Yeah. Donc, en fait, à côté de chez eux, il y avait un saut de 18 mètres et c'est Tifu qui leur a fait faire ce truc. Yeah, he just... Tifu will do a little backflip, like, it's easy for him. <laughs> and I'm over here like, okay, let me just perfectly do this. <laughs> I'm gonna go straight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that, so... That era was crazy. That Fortnite really revitalized gaming because it was kind of, again, it, like gaming has been like this, you know, and then Fortnite came back and then, and then it's kind of like, I, I feel like right now it's a little bit on the decline, but, yes. it's, but it's still bigger than it's ever been. Of course. Because there are kids younger and younger and like, you know, you know how the world now is so soft. It's very sensitive. Yes. Right. And that's because there's so many more little kids online. I really you think it's uh, because of this? That's 100% it. I mean that's the main reason, you know, you know my, in my opinion because like think about it, like all these little kids hopping on, their parents are thinking like, bro, we can't have parents who work like at these big companies and stuff, like they could get fired if like some, you know, it's like it's just like a whole a whole mess. I feel that. like it's the a shift in the mentality uh, for, for some reasons, but I uh, I don't Like, I didn't think about maybe the fact that there are a lot of kids now online. Yeah, that shit. I hate that shit, bro. I hate how Same. soft it is. Like, I want to be able to just speak my mind freely and uh, it is what it is. But I understand, you know, so. Um, uh, what was, is that your question? No, we were speaking a little bit about Fortnite, about how it was successful for FaZe and stuff. You spoke about Tifu, about the oh, gaming. I, ha- I have this funny story. So this is, uh, I was getting off my stream playing Fortnite and this is in 2018. Mm-hmm at 2 a.m. And I go to hltv.org because that's like the home of Counter-Strike, competitive Counter-Strike, because I knew we were playing in uh, this tournament in Katowice. Though. Yes. And we had just lost to Cloud9 like two, three months ago in the major in Boston, right? So now we're in this tournament in Katowice. I'm like, all right, let me just see when the next game is because I know it starts very early for me since I'm in California. And so I, 2 a.m., I go to hltv.org I look, I see phase next game at 4 a.m. versus Cloud9 quarterfinals. I'm like, the revenge. Yeah, I was like, there's no way I'm not missing this. Bro, I stayed up from 4 a.m. I didn't have any coffee or nothing. 
I stayed up from 4 a.m. until the games finished till 9 a.m. The American watching times are tough. Fully, bro, I was fully locked in. I wasn't falling asleep at all. The whole time I'm watching this, like, and it was fucking crazy, bro. The, it, the last map was Inferno. And the same, it was like the same thing. The last map for the last game, when we played them in the major, was Inferno. Went to double overtime and we lost. This one, same thing. Went to double overtime, but we won. won. Oh, bro, I went, I, I went on Twitter at like 9 a.m. I'm like, yes! I was so fucking happy, bro. I was so happy. The, the coin, coin flipped on your side. Yes, this time. bro. Oh, my God. And that game was insane. Like, that whole series was crazy. Anybody that watched that will understand. Like. Hey, the, they are speaking about this in the chat as well. Alice, je, si tu peux juste focus la réponse sur uh, Fortnite, comme ça, après, je peux tranquillement uh, embrayer sur un autre coin. Yes, euh, pas de souci. Du coup, euh, il disait que, euh, en fait, euh, donc c'est Banks qui avait recruté euh, Tifu, qu'il avait découvert euh, par euh, l'intermédiaire de son frère quand il avait presque pas de viewers sur ses streams. C'est ça. Et euh, qu'en fait, après, bah, ils ont déménagé du coup dans les maisons parce qu'en fait, ils ont deux énormes manoirs avec euh, quatre étages. Donc, comme tu disais, avec des piscines, des boîtes de nuit, des trucs de striptease, <rire> euh, un folie, peu de la folie, ouais. quoi. Euh, et qu'en fait, euh, Banks, en fait, il a tout appris à Tifu parce qu'il lui a dit, écoute, mec, euh, le jour où Fortnite ça existe plus, bah, tu peux pas juste faire euh, faire ça. Il faut que tu apprennes à faire ton propre content et tout et c'est là qu'il s'est complètement ouvert qu'il a commencé à prendre des caméras à filmer des trucs et c'est là qu'il a fait du coup il racontait l'histoire euh, du backflip de 18 mètres euh, dans le, le truc euh, à Hollywood là dans la rivière et tout donc euh, c'était un peu insane et en fait après il disait que du coup ouais pour lui Fortnite ça s'est flou... soufflé un petit peu mais bon comme c'était un jeu qui était vraiment pour les enfants et qui avait de plus en plus d'enfants sur internet et tout bah qui pensait que ça avait quand même un avenir quoi c'était moins populaire qu'avant mais ça reste quand même ouais, c'était toujours immense des gosses quoi ouais voilà Exactement, exactement. Il y avait aussi une petite discussion, il disait s'il pense que les gens sur Internet sont devenus de plus en plus, on va dire, soft, donc euh, entre guillemets douillets, fragiles, un petit truc comme ça. Il pense que c'est aussi par le fait qu'il y ait beaucoup d'enfants de, et de personnes très jeunes maintenant sur les réseaux. Moi, je lui ai dit que je pensais que c'était aussi un changement de mentalité, mais c'est une théorie qui est intéressante, c'est quelque chose qu'il qu n'aime pas trop d'ailleurs. Le fait qu'il ouais. euh, aimerait bien pouvoir s'exprimer plus librement. C'est ça, qu'il ne pouvait plus dire un peu ce qu'il voulait parce qu'il fallait faire attention, vu qu'il y avait des petits-enfants, qu'il fallait un peu euh, éviter de parler mal et tout, Exactement. pour pas trop les, les brusquer. Quoi. Exactement, arrondir les angles. Uh, I'm going to speak about something else. Uh, in Europe, many esports structures are trying to get like ambassadors to make content and stuff. Uh, it's something that FaZe more or less created back then. Uh, you got like dozens of members. Uh, uh, you even have like rappers, streamers and stuff that like uh, represent the brand. Um, how would you describe phase strategy uh, what do uh, do the ambassadors bring to the brand and how do you choose them uh, I think it's very natural I think it, it's all people that we like you know all people that we really mesh with all people that we um, we see ourselves being around you know if it's someone that we can't really be around it doesn't make sense but if it's someone that is like a homie you know if it's someone and uh, if it's someone that's creating something that Like whatever it is their lane is, whether they're an artist, whether they're an athlete, if it's someone that we like and we really like see uh, efforts to, uh, a lot of times, like most times it's mutual. Most times it'll be like, bro, like I'm a big fan of your, your music and stuff. And like, dude, I've been watching like FaZe, like, like I've been watching you since like the beginning or, you know, I've been watched, I grew up on you guys, like stuff like that. So a lot of times it's mutual. Um, but I think it's just the concept of no limits, you know, like, there this this world that we're in we're creating like it's not it hasn't been created it's not like traditional sports where there's rules and regulations yes you know there's no rules and regulations everything uh, needed to be done there's rules and regulations to esports but not to the the entire landscape behind it so that 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 landscape is all created by you you decide to what, what you want it to look like um and uh we were fortunate enough to like get in there early and really you know and start doing this stuff early but it's it's uh it's just people that we believe in people that we care about people that we're passionate about that's who we like to bring in under under the umbrella I really think that you are doing it right. And uh, phase, uh, same for 100 Thieves, for example, is an example that uh, I often bring because in Europe uh, for the esports structure and esports teams, uh, they, they take some ambassadors, but it's ambassador who will like uh, retweet uh, one or two tweets, make uh, two pictures. Yeah. But nothing really good or concrete. Like it's kind of boring to be honest. And, and the way you're doing that. it is the good way, I think. Thank you. No, people feel that. Like they, 
and the on the internet people smell authenticity from miles away you know kilometers away and you're, you know <laughs> oh but yeah it's it's uh it's important to just be authentic be real and like do things that really make sense and um shout out to all my guys you know because I, I wouldn't be here without them so um mad love and respect to everybody that's r really been a part of our scene and, and even the community too because we've can't do this without the community you know this is everybody everybody here watching is that that community and um and there's like a massive community behind that that's not watching that's helped build this so um it's all love man it's like it's just like we're we're, we're blessed to do what we love to do you of know course. we're so blessed we're beyond blessed man it's it's, it's ah yeah yeah big luck big luck on va parler un petit peu des ambassadeurs etc alice est-ce que tu peux nous synthétiser tout ça s'il te plaît Yes, alors euh, comme tu disais, tout, pour toi, un peu nous, les ambassadeurs qu'on a en Europe en général, euh, dans les équipes, ils sont là pour retweeter genre euh, deux, trois trucs. Euh, ouais, comme mettre ça, par le semaine, maillot, peu, faire deux, trois balourdises, quoi. Exactement. Et en fait, pour lui, bah, c'est pas du tout, c'est pas du tout ce qu'il voulait. Donc, quand il choisit ses ambassadeurs, pour lui, c'est vraiment des gens qui doivent avoir les mêmes valeurs euh, que que Faze, qui soient un peu en accord. Et en général, il disait que c'était réciproque. Tu vois, il prenait que des gens qui eux les aimaient bien et qui en même temps connaissaient le travail, pour qu'il y ait vraiment un truc, il y a un, un bon feeling, quoi. Si le sentait pas, il prenait pas la personne. Et euh, il disait que pour lui, c'était hyper important d'être hyper authentique. Et d'ailleurs, il remerciait bah, tous, les, tous les gens avec qui, avec qui il est, toute la communauté, même les gens qui regardent et tout, parce que pour lui, c'est hyper important, parce que bah, sans, sans vous, il ne serait pas là. Quoi. Face, ça n'existerait pas et ça ne serait pas pareil. Il a dit que les gens pouvaient sentir l'authenticité à des kilomètres à la ronde. Je suis bien d'accord avec lui, quand même. Ça, ça, ça c'est des choses qui se ressentent, c'est des choses... Euh, je pense que aussi, de temps en temps, même si on ne connaît pas toujours une personne, etc., c'est quelque chose qui peut se remarquer. I was saying that you were uh, saying something right about uh, the fact that people could smell the authenticity like miles away. And uh, even if you are not always right about uh, some online persona, because uh, in fact, you don't really know them. But I think sometimes there is... You can feel it. There's yeah, some sign uh, that, that... On dit que des signes qui ne trompent pas. Comment on peut dire des signes qui ne trompent pas, Alice Uh, I mean, there are signs. You can't miss them, right? That's, yeah, that's what you want to say. say. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. That's one of the biggest things I've learned in life, too. Um, is, uh, you got to go with your gut, you know? Like, when you don't oh, know good. what to do, like, go with your gut. Your gut knows, you know what I'm saying? Like, way before your mind does, like, you feel it. You feel that in you. And so it's just about, if you're connected with your body, you'll understand, like, and a lot of times you'll meet some really, like, shady people that don't want the best for you, that actually want to take advantage of you. And those are the most important times where you got to really like use your gut feeling, go with your gut feeling. A few months ago, uh, you started um, your, uh, I'm going to say, your bo boxing career. Uh, and after a victory, there was also like a difficult defeat against uh, Slim during the KSI's event. Uh, do you still plan on continuing? And how do you prepare for a fight? And even why did you start boxing? Um, why I started boxing, I, I've done martial arts for half my life. When I was like 11, I started doing Taekwondo. I did that for two years, two, three years. And then uh, when I was 18, I started doing like kickboxing and like Muay Thai. Did that for like three years. Um, and <coughs> did a little bit of jujitsu, just a little bit. And then I, I boxed for like a, like a year, but I didn't really learn proper boxing. I kind of just learned how to throw punches and conditioning. <laughs> okay. Because boxing isn't just throwing punches. Boxing is footwork, defense. Um, stamina. Stamina, your endurance. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and there's... So a year after I was training boxing. So I, I would say, like, I don't even count that year as training boxing. I would just count that year as conditioning. Why? Right. Um, I really started boxing last year, last September. And I was going to fight Slim, actually, in... We were supposed to fight in October. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think we were supposed to fight in October of last year. That fight didn't happen, but I started training in September with my coach. And then my coach is, he's an amazing coach. He uh, really understands the art of boxing. He uh, learned from one of the best, and uh, that's Joe Goosen. And Joe Goosen is a legendary uh, boxing trainer, and, and, uh, and he's a commentator too. He's all the, all the big boxing events. He's like, one of the, like, he's like the best voice. He's the guy that actually understands it better than anybody. He's like close to 70 years old. He started in his boxing journey when he was 16. Yes. So he's got so many years. You know what I'm saying? Like Almost damn 50 near, years. It's a, a little bit over 50, right? Like just, yeah, pretty much. Um, so my, uh, my trainer, he learned from him. And then now he's teaching me a lot. Uh, and I've been, I've been pretty 
pretty consistent with, with the training since I first started. And I've learned so much and I've grown to love the art of boxing and, and, and everything that comes with it. And, and the workouts are so intense, man. Like they're like, it's changed my life. And I, I, I can't see myself like, I always wondered what it would feel like to enter in a ring and really fight someone. You know, I always wanted to know. Like, like throw the punch for real. Exactly, because like a lot of times I'd be watching this, like I see these people fighting and stuff. And I'm just like, what the fuck does it feel like to be in there? Like to really like, so I got to experience it. My first fight was in March, March 5th of this year. Yes. And um, I, I had a good amount. Of, my training really picked up after I came back from Brazil. I spent two weeks in Brazil. Uh, for New Year's, and then mm -hmm. I came back, and my training really picked up, and that's when I, that's when training really started for me. Um, before it was a lot lighter, and so after that, like I just, I would show up every day in the gym. We'd put in like hours at the gym every day, and like I would, um, on top of that, I was going to do strength and conditioning too. I was really taking this very serious, and then before my fight, like the last month or so, I'd start running too. On top of that. So I'd be working out three times a day. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, just like... Really, really intense period. Yeah, yeah like, and um, I learned so much about this. And, like, I had so much... I, I had a lot of success in sparring. Like, I think that's the biggest thing. Like, for training boxing, I think the best thing that you can do, um, best experience before you actually get in a fight is sparring. And then number two would be uh, shadow boxing, you know? <laughs> It's, uh, and then number three would be like hitting the bags. Okay. So th like those things, uh, you'll become a lot better and stuff uh, just doing those things. And so I, I, I just felt a lot comfortable, a lot more comfortable boxing. And I felt very confident going into this fight. There was no doubt in my mind that I was going to lose th that fight in March. And uh, um, I had, I'll, I don't know if you saw like what happened, but basically it was five rounds. You could argue that I maybe lost one round, mm -hmm. but I won like the whole, you know what I'm saying? Like I won, it was clear that I won. In the very end of the fight, they lift up the, my opponent's hand. And that was, bro, everyone saw like I got robbed. Like You, you, and, you felt you got robbed? Oh yeah, no, I clearly got robbed. Even, even uh, my opponent was like, huh? Like he was, all right, and that was, that was uh, Kenny. I fought Kenny in, in the UK on a different card. And so I felt, I never felt more violated in my life, more like humiliated, you know what I'm saying? Just like they took my moment of victory from me. I was ready to talk, you know, give my speech and stuff, just like say what I wanted to say. And then I just, I like walked off and, and that was that. It took me two weeks to process all those emotions. I can't know? imagine how it feels. Bro, I, I remember that night we went out, like all the homies went out because a lot of the phase guys were there, like Jarvis, Adap, like Mongrel, Um, a lot of the guys were there, uh, Frazier and stuff, and um, they were at the club, and, like, I low-key didn't even want to go because, you know, like, the stuff that happened, but I was like, you know what, like, I know I won that fight, but let me just pull up. I didn't make myself a single drink that night. People just kept, like, feeding me shots and stuff, and I, I got, I was wasted. <laughs> I was wasted. <laughs> but Completely. I didn't, oh, yeah, I was wasted. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, um, you know, that happened, and then, that week we try to appeal the decision mm -hmm. fortunately after a week it got overturned so i got the win right and that never happens in boxing so that was the cool. feeling uh... yeah and so um then my next fight was going to be against blue face. blue face and uh he had to get pulled out because he got into something and uh, they had to pull him out right okay and so we weren't able to fight so i was training for him and he's a southpaw like myself so i was training uh, like mainly against like southpaws or and if they weren't southpaws like in sparring they would so he got pulled out and then five weeks before the fight slim accepts you know he's like he, he replaces him and so um then i had to train for an orthodox which was slim and like i, I was very confident about this fight like I, i had no doubt in my mind that i was gonna lose you know like that i was gonna win um and It was just a lot of things happening, you know, the week before. I'm not going to get into it, but, like, just, like, some problems with my girlfriend and then, like, some problems with, like, uh, the guy that I worked with. And, okay. Uh, some overall personal problems. Yeah, like, the week, the fight week, right? It was, it was like, a lot of bad things that, like, I'm not even going to get into. Um, but the day of the fight, you know, I slept. I got my sleep in. I felt good coming into it. I felt like I was like, all right, I feel good. Like, all the stuff's handled. We're good, you know? Um And then uh, 
So Sensei was actually, so Sensei is the guy that taught me kickboxing okay. ten, 10 years ago and back in Boston. He runs a martial arts school uh, full of black belts. Like his, his, uh, I mean, his family's all black belts. And so I got to learn kickboxing from him. He's one of my brothers. He ended up living in the first phase house with us for a little bit and he's, he became a part of phase. But for the first two years I knew him, he was just my martial arts instructor. We weren't friends. Then fast forward, he's got a lot of fights. Like he's got like four or five fights. I went to like most of them. And then now we're in the same card together, me and him. Like, and now he's fighting my last opponent, Kenny. And he was two fights before me because I was the co-main event. And then, it's, and then it's me versus Slim. No, it was Sensei and uh, Kenny and then Deji and uh, who did he fight? I forget. But anyways, I'll, I'm in the locker room, like wrapping up my hands, like my coach is wrapping up my hands. And then uh, I decide, like, Sensei's coming on, so I'm like, yo, put it on the TV. We turn on the TV, and now we're watching this. Because only reason I watched it was because I knew it was going to be cakewalk for Sensei. It was going to be very easy for him. I just had a feeling he was going to win the fight, like, because I know Sensei. But you knew him, you knew he was good, he, he learned you got, 10 years ago. So yeah, I got respect for up. Kenny. For, I got respect for Kenny for even taking that fight, because Sensei knows what he's doing, you know? So um, the fight pretty much went how I thought it was going to go. Very easy for Sensei. And uh, he was winning every, pretty much every single round. And at the very end, guess what happens? They lift up Kenny's hand again. Bro, when I tell you there's not a single person on this planet that that decision could have affected more than me, like it wasn't even close. It gave you PTSD. Uh... It gave me PTSD. All those, the two weeks that it took me to process all those emotions went straight back into me. And I'm like, no fucking way. You know, it's one thing when I get like, when people take advantage of me, but when people take advantage of my friends, you know what I'm saying? It's a different feeling. Like I was so mad. I was so mad. And that's never how you want to go into a fight. You never want to go into a fight like mad. Like you don't think straight. You never want to do anything mad. You know, like when you're upset, when you're really mad, you're not thinking straight. You're, nope. not, you're not calm. You're not collected. You're not like, your eyes aren't like this. You're just like this. And so you're not thinking about anything else. And so, you know, it, it'd be one thing if I, if I lost, like I, I lost fair and square because I, you know what I'm saying? I'm not like, I don't like to sound like I'm making excuses, but at the same time, I'm not going to tell you how, it, I'm not going to sugarcoat, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is really, sorry. Like, this is really what happened. Like this, I went out there and I started to walk out and um, they're like, yo, your coach can't walk with you. I'm like, all right, whatever. So then I see Slim go up, he walks out, they put in his two songs, he walks out to like a thousand miles, like some funny song. And uh, he, he had like two of his songs, right? And he's, he's having a blast, he's doing his thing. And then it was my turn to walk out, they're like, Phase Temper. And then they play a, a whole different song, bro. Okay. Uh -huh. I was waiting to hear Right Above It by Lil Wayne. I was waiting for the trumpets and then they're playing some song that I've never heard of my entire life. And so I'm walking out to some random fucking song Like, just feeling violated again. Oh, I'm back in the UK. They're doing this shit again. Like, like fuck, bro. Like, and I, I just wanted to fucking kill this kid. I wanted to take my anger and frustration from because of the UK onto Slim. But, bro, like, just didn't work, bro. It just, like, it, that wasn't it. That's not how you want to go into a fight. When I went back after the first round to my corner, my coach is telling me things. I'm not even listening to what yes. you're saying. I'm, like, looking away. I'm, like... You're here, but you don't even. I like, wasn't there, pick it bro. Up. I was in a different place that night. I couldn't have been in a much worse headspace. You know what I'm saying? I, and when it comes to sports and like competitive sports, I love that shit. I've, I went to the state finals of um, my volleyball and during high school, like I took that very serious. Like soccer, I, football, I played that very serious. Gaming, you know, I took that super serious. Um, skateboarding, even. But I, I'm very competitive. And when it comes to situations where I need to perform, like the finals. I always perform. I always do really well during those moments. This was the only time in my life where I underperformed. Mm. And it sucks, but it is what it is. It was a learning lesson. You know, um, shout out, you know, Slim was a better boxer that night. And, um, and that's that. But that's definitely not the end of me for, for, for boxing, bro. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm getting back in the fucking ring. That's I got a lot it. to prove, and I can't wait to prove it to everybody. Magnifique. C'était très, très, très exhaustif. Il nous a parlé un petit peu de comment il boxe, comment il s'y est mis, etc. Si Alice peut nous résumer tout ça. 
Yes, alors euh, du coup il disait qu'il avait toujours fait des arts martiaux depuis son plus jeune âge, donc il a fait du taekwondo, du, kickbo du kickboxing, euh, du jujutsu et tout, mais ça. la boxe il en avait que très très peu fait, il avait juste, enfin genre il savait juste cogner quoi, donc il jugeait pas vraiment que c'était vraiment de la boxe, et euh, en fait en septembre dernier, donc de l'année dernière euh, 2021, il euh, y a un coach qui, qui lui a appris, donc euh, son coach qui lui-même a appris de Joe Goussen, qui est un peu genre le, le maître de, de la boxe, qui a maintenant genre 70 ans et tout. Et euh, en fait, euh, il s'y est mis et il a adoré. Genre pour lui, les, entra les entraînements étaient hyper extrêmes, c'était très intense. Euh, il s'entraînait trois fois par jour et tout. Et il devait avoir son premier combat en mars, du coup, contre King Kenny Exactement. Aux, euh, en Angleterre. Et euh, du coup, euh, il s'y est mis à fond, quoi. Donc euh, vraiment tous les jours, euh, trois fois par jour et tout. Et il y allait tous les jours et il adorait ça. Et euh, en fait, euh, ce qui s'est passé, c'est que quand il est allé se battre du coup en mars, bah, il a perdu, alors que normalement, il était censé gagner. Et mais vraiment de, de, de très loin. Donc euh, là, il était super furax et tout, euh, super énervé. Et euh, pendant deux semaines, il bouillonnait. Euh, ils ont même dû, euh, tout le face clan dû, a dû le faire sortir en boîte de nuit et euh, le saouler jusqu'au bout parce que euh, sinon, euh, ça allait pas passer. Et au final, ils ont fait appel. Et ça se passe jamais en boxe normalement et en fait ils ont ils ont réussi à, à gagner l'appel et à le faire gagner le match donc officiellement il a il a gagné. Mais c'est une victoire un peu tu vois genre c'est comme un peu volé Dich... quoi. Ouais c'est comme Andy Schleck quand il prend le Tour de France en 2010 parce que contre t'adore un, un truc positif t'as vécu toute ta vie en deuxième et puis après on dit deux semaines plus tard ah bah ouais t'as gagné mais t'as pas ce feeling tu vois. C'est ça donc il était déjà il était super furax quoi enfin vraiment là il bouillonnait la tension elle a mis du temps à redescendre euh, comme tu disais il y a encore un peu de, de trauma quand il en parle ça se voyait quoi il avait un peu le seum quoi. Et euh, du coup, en octobre, il devait face euh, blue face, du coup, en, en boxe, mais il y a eu un problème, et du coup, c'est Slim qui l'a remplacé. Et donc, euh, lui, il y allait super confiant, hein. il s'était bien, bien entraîné et tout, euh, il pensait qu'il allait gagner, même s'il avait eu quelques soucis perso la semaine du combat, il pensait quand même que, que c'était pour lui. Et en fait, du coup, il racontait qu'il y avait Sensei, du coup, qui, est aussi, euh, par, euh, qui fait aussi partie de Face, qui était un peu son... Mentor son mentor, ouais, parce que c'est lui qui lui a pris le kickboxing et tout, Exactement. qui devait se battre contre Kenny. Et donc ça se passait encore en Angleterre. Et euh, du coup, euh, Temper disait, euh, bah, respect à Kenny, quoi, parce que euh, il savait très bien qu'il allait se faire éclater, quoi, donc c'était pas possible. Et du coup, euh, donc lui, il était en train de se préparer parce qu'il jouait juste après. Et ce qui s'est passé, c'est que bah, Sensei a perdu et que Kenny a été euh, mis comme vainqueur, alors que... C'était un vol C'était un vol C'était ouais, encore un vol de, de Kenny versus Sensei, it was a robbery et donc euh, lui il est là, il est dans la pièce et tout, il bouillonne, il se dit putain faut que je passe juste après, ça va être mon tour et tout, ça va être mon match mais euh, il racontait et très justement genre bah quand c'est toi qu'on offense bah t'es affecté mais quand c'est tes potes à qui on touche c'est encore pire donc là il était vraiment euh, furax et du coup bah quand il, est, quand il est rentré sur scène en plus il lui avait mis une musique pétée c'était pas du tout ce à quoi il s'attendait quand, quand il devait monter donc euh, là vraiment il disait oh, franchement l'Angleterre ils vont encore me la faire c'est pas possible et du coup il, il a perdu et il le dit et il assume complètement hein. il dit euh, je sais que j'ai perdu et tout je vais pas m'inventer des excuses mais en même temps il s'était passé plein de trucs puis il y avait eu le truc en plus de, de Sensei sur scène et que ça, ça le saoulait parce qu'il performait toujours qu'il était très compétitif et tout il adorait la compétition mais que là pour le coup bah, ça arrivait et qu'il avait pas bien performé mais qu'il s'arrêtait pas ici et qu'il allait bien continuer parce qu'il adorait ça exactement voilà, là, là. yo yo shout out Ali she's way cooler than all of us Like what? She's the best. She's way cooler than Thank all you. of us, bro. What? She's the best. How do you do that? Like I can barely like when 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 like my girlfriend tells me something, I'll remember like two or three words or something that from like a you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just your brain, you know. It's just made that way. You got you way just, cool. You, know, you got a way doper brain than we do. She's professional. I think. I think. Genre, she she made it like uh, for a cinema interview and stuff. Si je dis pas de bêtises, Alice, t'as fait des trucs pour du cinéma, c'est ça? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I work with actors. Like I'm an interpreter in French and English, so I get. I'm used to do that. That's sick. It's fine. That's so sick. She's really, really good. At first, we thought uh, maybe we could do something like uh, she could speak like at the same time as you, but it was quite hard, you know, yeah, like yeah. Uh, to do something like this was really super tough. So we decided to jump on and make some translation a little bit after. Maybe uh, the interview is not as smooth as without translator, but uh, we, we kind of have to do it. And I think right. it's the best way. No, no, yeah, because hearing amazing. your voice in French at uh, the same time as you speak, it can be like difficult for you. Oh, yeah. It's very tricky. Yeah, yeah. Very, very tricky. I have one last question. It's almost two hours now. Dang, yeah. Two hours. I mean, listen, it's a lot, man. The story is a lot. So. But 
It's been it's been a long time, like twelve plus years, bro. It's a long time. I, I'm having a good time. I'm sure the probably people probably gonna are have a long time with Hector too. Of course, yeah, of course. With Hector, it's gonna be crazy. And tell tell yourself, in France, it's one a.m. Actually, in the mo wow. it's one a.m. and they are still here. How you say good morning in France? Good, uh, on dit uh, good morning. On dit bonne journée. Bonjour, bonjour. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. Oh yeah. Bonjour. So good afternoon is bonjour too. Good, good afternoon is bon après midi. Ah okay. Alright, ah, bonjour, mon ami. <laughs> bonjour, but 1 a.m. Uh, they're gonna go to sleep. So if you want like to tell them something, uh, it's better to say bonne nuit. Oh, okay. Yeah, bonne nuit. Bonne nuit, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bonne nuit. Bonne nuit for the people uh, who are going to sleep. And uh, I think a few uh, are still here for a couple of times. Um, my last question would be, um, how do you picture uh, your future and your projects? Uh, you have been doing like YouTube contents and stuff for now 12 years. Uh, you have been a face member for 12 years. You have been uh, now doing some boxing in a couple of months. Uh, you, we just spoke about it. Um, how do you picture your project and you, your future and your project and how, uh, how do you still have the drive to go ahead and make some things? Um, I'll answer the last question first. How do I still have the drive to do all this? It's like, for me, um, money was never the motive, you know? It always came second. Um, but at the same time, like I've grown to learn that we need to prioritize that too, because otherwise someone else will, and then they're going to be taking your, your cut of it. You know, you're going you're gonna to be getting less than what you, you should. But, um, the drive comes from the passion from, from all, from all this stuff. I, my goal from the beginning, from pretty much the beginning of phase was I want this brand to outlive us. Okay. I want, I always looked at like. FC Barcelona, Real Madrid, they've been around for a hundred plus years. That should be us. People come be. and go, but the brand stays. Stays. It's gonna outlive us. Like this, it will outlive us. As long as long as we don't fuck it up and like it'll take a lot to fuck up. You know what I'm saying? So um my like my personal future plans was like now that we're public, which is you know incredible that we were able to go public this year when the economy hasn't been the best, you know, for a lot of a lot of companies aren't doing so well you know um we're with the context the, the global context and stuff the what the global economic context yeah, exactly and stuff. um a lot of com companies aren't doing that well but we were somehow able to go public this year which is amazing so now um we're gonna get a lot more money you know invested in us because they can and um at some point i'm gonna take a little bit out because obviously like you know like so just so i can live comfortably but i also want to stay invested in this of because this is my life project you know this is something that i want to do for the rest of my life uh i'm you know like and, and it requires all of us like we all all the founders like we all have to be aligned which which we are like now it's for a while we weren't but now we're finally like back aligned back where we should be and um there, there's a lot that we're working on right now just so you know like there's a lot that we're working on i can't really talk about but i'm so excited for you know these next coming months um I'm really excited. Big projects? Yeah, yeah. yeah on your sure. face. We can see yeah, it on your it's, face. <laughs> it's like things that ha should have happened are going to happen and, and a lot more. Um, you sold a little bit of your shares? That's what I, uh, you no, said? No, no, no. I, I will at some point. Okay. I haven't yet. Um, and like, just, just a little bit, just to like live comfortably, you know what I'm saying? Like, and uh, I've, uh, I'm with, I have a girlfriend now and like fully invested in her. She's amazing. She's incredible. And I, I was- Big love. Yeah, I was blessed to, to meet her. She's really- a uh, wonderful girl and um i see you know i see me spending the rest of my life with this girl and uh and that's how uh, that's the only thing we can uh, like uh, want for you yeah thank you brother thank you um and uh you know so i just i just think she's got an amazing family she comes from a great family uh, i'm gonna spend thanksgiving with, with with her and her family uh this year and uh i think like just you know just the the normal dream for a lot of people like you you get you get a family family you know what i'm saying like you have you raise kids like a little face temper you know what i mean a mini, <laughs> a mini little a mini little temper shot you know what i'm saying a little temper junior <laughs> um, <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna be raised with a like a, an xbox in his hands yeah <laughs> an, an xbox in his hands a little like sock like a ball sock a football on his on his shoe you know what i mean some boxing gloves <laughs> all that But um, yeah, that definitely that. I mean, um, just I want Phase to really. The main thing for me though is Phase to be 
where it should be, you know, to really like put this brand into like the light that it should be in and do the things that we should have been doing before. And um, I take this shit really serious, you know, and, and as, as do everybody else that's around me. So it's just about making sure that we're surrounded by like-minded people and uh, getting rid of like the dead weight and just moving forward. Superb, superb. Beautiful answer. Uh, Alice is going to translate it. Then I have some two quick questions from the chat. Okay. They, they asked some questions. So I'm going to just go ahead and uh, ask, uh, ask, ask, ask them. Alice, est-ce que tu peux genre nous faire cette magnifique réponse parce que ça a une partie familiale, un peu émotion, j'ai kiffé. Yes, alors euh, du coup il disait que pour lui un peu le futur et tout, enfin déjà il a commencé par dire que il avait jamais, ça avait jamais été pour de l'argent ce qu'il faisait, c'était vraiment ça. genre, c'était vraiment la passion et il a vraiment insisté dessus pour dire que lui il s'en foutait l'argent, c'était second, c'était cool si ça arrivait, mais c'était pas pourquoi il faisait ça et pas pourquoi il avait commencé. Pas la première motivation et, euh, ouais. Exactement, et il disait qu'avec le contexte économique il y avait plein de, de boîtes et tout qui s'étaient un peu cassé la gueule et tout, mais que lui c'était le projet de sa vie et qu'il était super content que du coup Face ça marche super bien parce que pour lui, bah, comme tu disais, les gens ils viennent, ils partent, mais la marque elle reste pour toujours quoi. Et donc comme tout fonctionne super bien, pour lui il disait que maintenant tout était hyper aligné, donc euh, il pensait un peu à, à vendre quelques de ses parts pour être un peu euh, tranquille, parce que comme il disait, voilà, donc il y a des gros projets avec Face qui arrivent dans quelques mois, ça. et puis surtout maintenant il est avec sa, copine, euh, avec sa copine, et il voit son futur avec elle et tout, donc un peu le rêve de fonder une famille, tout ça avec, euh, comme tu disais, un mini Face Temper, avec un, un enfant, ballon, etc. une manette et tout, mais que pour lui, enfin pour lui Face c'est le projet de sa vie, quoi. donc euh, c'est quelque chose qu'il prend très au sérieux et qu'il voulait être super bien entouré pour le faire et que c'était le cas en ce moment. Exactement. Les deux, the last two question uh, I will be, uh, uh, the last question I will be asking, uh, our question I picked up uh, from the chat. Uh, one of the guy in the chat asked uh, if uh, Faze ever had any interest uh, in League of Legends and uh, if one day maybe if there was an opening and stuff because uh, now it's very expensive uh, to get in, but if Faze could maybe uh, be in League of Legends. We've talked about it. We've talked about League of Legends uh, back in like 2017 um, when we were coming, like when we were starting with CSGO. When Optic came in too, it was in 2017 too. They came into League? Oh, they did? Optic had a roster in League of Legends, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, we, we talked about it. We um, didn't pull the trigger on it because it's not something that we're passionate about, you know? Like okay. We just, that's the main thing. It if, wasn't a game that was speaking to you? Yeah, if it's not something that we have personal interest in, then It's how can we fight for it? Even know? if there is a business in incentive, you didn't go for it because the patient wasn't there. Exactly. That's that's the main thing for us. But that doesn't mean we're not. That doesn't mean we're going to be close to it in the future. Like who knows? Maybe in the future we'll we'll get into it. I mean, I I see I see us being on a, a lot of different things. So I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if we pick up a League of Legends team later on. Ok. Donc il disait que en gros LOL c'était pas trop leur truc, ils avaient pas trop de passion sur League of Legends, c'était pas un jeu qui les intéressait et c'est pour ça qu'ils ne se sont pas mis, mais il a dit euh, sait-on jamais, peut-être que dans le futur, s'il y a une possibilité, il y aura peut-être un jour une équipe League of Legends. En gros la porte est pas totalement fermée. Ils en avaient parlé en 2017, à l'époque où Optic, eux, avaient pris un roster, mais ça ne s'était pas fait. Ils ont plutôt euh, focus des jeux euh, qui kiffait bien. The last uh, question. Ah, it's because it's the biggest team in France, so I'm just going to go ahead. Do you know about, about Carmine Corp? Carmine Corp? Carmine KC, the tag KNC. It's a big sport team in France, and they have many players in Rocket League, League of Legends and stuff, and it's the most popular brand in France. I, I don't, unfortunately. No, you don't? I don't, no. The, I... the KC is really a big, big, big roster, and they are starting to do big things, and uh, they wanted to know if you ever heard about them okay i haven't i'm i need to be watching more rocket league and you said rocket league and league of legends rocket league and league of legends okay. uh, right now and uh, i think we'll valorant be expanding as well. valorant okay. as well oh sick no I, i don't know i haven't been following those esports um i know we have a rocket league and, and valorant team but i haven't been following it like i just be watching cs if i watch anything okay have you ever heard about kameto maybe it's a big france uh, french streamer i haven't kameto Ex excuse my no. ignorance oh, yeah, yeah. Just fine. I asked the question. The yeah. ask uh, uh, the chat asked me to do it. 
I did it. Um, listen, uh, Temper, I'm uh, Tommy. I'm really glad that we made this. Uh, we are at the end now. Uh, it was a, a really good, good, good show. It was the first episode. I was kind of stressed a little bit because it's, it's the first time I managed to do like something in English for more than one hour. Yeah. Even two hours now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think it went as smooth as I could imagine. So big thank you for uh, welcoming us and coming as the first guest for Zakoroli USA. Big love to me. I loved it. Man, you're the fucking man, bro. I really appreciate you having me. This is amazing. This is the best like podcast or interview I've ever done by far. It's really? Not, yeah, by far. The best one? Oh yeah, easily. No, you, 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 you made it super smooth, very like the whole way through. I, I really appreciate you for coming out here and, and, uh, and doing this over here. And you're the man, bro. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. It's a at least big emotion. <laughs> No, for sure. Mad love for you guys. And shout outs to France too. Like I got so much love for France. You guys are super passionate. Love you guys, bro. You guys the, are amazing. The French community loves face. The French community love you. Just to finish, it's one personal ask. Uh, we are in the face warehouse here in uh, LA. I'm with uh, one of the oldest members. Can we just do the face sign? Can you just like show me how we do, how it? You do it? And right. we finish the emission like you this. You got it. You got it. So you take the first two fingers and then bam. Like wait no you make an F so it's like an F so you make an F like but you gotta this? hide the the last fingers you know what Ooh. I'm saying so, so these two ah, right let's go like that right here yeah that's it yeah, man come on yeah. guys Faye Zach up in here bro Faye Zach is right here les gars <laughs> c'est terminé pour Zach Aroli premier épisode des États-Unis j'espère que vous avez kiffé je remercie Temper encore une fois d'avoir accepté de venir j'espère que vous avez passé une bonne émission je remercie également Alice merci Alice thank you Alice merci pour Alice. the live translation merci à vous thank you guys Alice a fait des travaux de zinzin. J'espère que vous avez aimé le format. J'espère que ça vous a parlé. Sincèrement, j'ai vraiment kiffé. C'était grave cool. Ce sera disponible sur YouTube très rapidement, dès demain, sur ma chaîne euh, YouTube. Comme d'habitude, vous savez bien que j'aime sortir les trucs rapido. Euh, on a essayé d'avoir la meilleure formule pour que ça parle à ceux qui parlent en anglais, mais également ceux euh, qui ne comprennent rien. Donc, si là, vous êtes dans le chat, vous ne vous parlez pas du tout anglais, si vous avez pu suivre, eh ben, ça veut dire qu'on a réussi notre mission. Et je suis très content. C'est vrai que c'était un horaire qui n'était pas facile. 23h, 1h du matin en France, ce n'est pas l'horaire idéal. C'est pour ça que mardi, Zach Enroulib revient pour un deuxième épisode. Ce sera, cette fois, ce sera à 21h, les gars. Donc, pas de 23h, minuit. Ce sera à 21h. Il n'y a pas de LDC en plus ce mardi. Et l'épisode devrait être normal. Allemand, il me l'avait confirmé, mais c'est cool, avec Ludwig. Voilà, Ludwig, gros streamer américain, l'un des plus gros. C'est également un Canadien qui parle français. Donc cette fois, le Zachary sera en français, il n'y aura même pas besoin de traduction. Et après, la semaine prochaine, je serai à Dallas, où j'aurai notamment Cream Six, Scump et X. Donc on a Hector. Donc on a vraiment euh, un très gros programme à venir dans les dix prochains jours. Euh, le, le, les USA, c'est vraiment la folie. Et on, on tente de faire un arc et de connecter les ponts avec les créateurs de contenu américains et que vous puissiez entendre des histoires que vous n'entendez peut-être pas forcément habituellement. Zach Olive, c'est terminé pour cette semaine. Thanks again, uh, Temper, for uh, coming. And uh, it's the end of the, the, this episode. Merci à vous les gars d'avoir suivi. On se dit à la prochaine. Ciao, ciao. Merci beaucoup, mon ami.